yeah. and I use a, a jackhammer pin and a sledgehammer. Yeah. yeah. While the uh, a piece of metal broke off the jackhammer pin and went like a missile into my leg, through my pants and into my leg. And wow. there, it, there it sits. Um, so uh, I'll have to have it surgically removed at some point, but right now it's too deep. Wow. Um, so we need it to kind of rise back up to the surface, but yeah. yeah. Well, I apologize for it for teasing you about it. I didn't know it was actually that serious. <laughs> it's, uh, it, you know, it's not, I'm fine. I, I, I'm just, it just hurts. Like I always say to my kids, it's only the pain that hurts. Well, now it's me that gets to experience it. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just shows your dedication to the cause, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get those signs up, Paul. <laughs> You'll get the last one up the day after the election. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> That's the best sign story I've ever heard. Yep. I've been through a lot of election cycles with different folks, so that's a good one. All right, I think I'm going to start this. So um, good evening, everybody. This is the Wednesday, October 7th, 2020, uh, Scarborough Town Council regular meeting. Um, this first item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, 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 uh. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, States of America. to the republic, republic to stand, stand one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. Uh, item number three is roll call. Tom? Yes, just for uh, the council's benefit, I have excused the town clerk. She is busy next door uh, doing uh, audit from today's uh, election activity. So uh, roll call, uh, Councilor Clucci. Here. Councilor Hayes. Here. Councilor Gleistein. Here. Councilor Katarina. Here. Councilor Johnson. Here. Councilor Hamill. Here. Chairman Johnson. Here. Okay, great. Uh, number four is general public comments on items that are not on the agenda. So if anybody in the audience, I believe we have 13 people with us. If anybody in the audience has general public comments for items not on the agenda. I do not see any. Bear with me. I'm just going to give everybody some time. Okay. Okay. Item number five is the approval of the minutes September 16, 2020 town council meeting and the September 30th, 2020 special town council meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. And any discussion? Sorry, uh, who seconded the motion? I didn't hear. Don, I believe. Okay, thank you. Yep. And Tom, can you just take the vote, please? Certainly. Councilor Clucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor, Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Okay, and item number six is adjustments to the agenda. Mr. Hamill, would you like to make an adjustment to the agenda? Yes, I'd like to request that the town manager's report uh, move to the top of the agenda, please. Thank you. Okay, without objections, I will do so. <laughs> item number seven is items to be signed, treasury warrants. I actually, I actually signed those finally at town hall yesterday, I believe. So those are signed. <clears throat> and before we get into the resolutions, I will ask uh, Mr. Hall to give us the town manager's report. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'd like to start off with, I guess, some sobering news. Um, I've advised council, but I, I'd like to use the opportunity to talk to the public as well. Uh, this past weekend, Sunday evening, we did have our first positive case in our fire department. This is a case, uh, this employee worked exclusively at the Dunstan station. Uh, very pleased to report that immediately on Monday morning, uh, we coordinated with uh, Maine CDC and they were extremely helpful in uh, and surgical, I, I should say, in terms of uh, uh, the contact tracing and really putting together a plan within an hour's time. Uh, consequently, we, as of yesterday, have tested 59 of our employees. It's really in an, in an overabundance of caution, but certainly appropriate. And we're awaiting the re results as to whether there's any other uh, additional positive cases. I'm pleased to report the employee is home, um, is exhibiting some very minor symptoms and and so she's do, uh, they're doing well 
um, and I'll certainly keep you apprised. Uh, we're hopeful that it, it uh, doesn't turn into anything more. And I think we're taking all the necessary precautions. And then more recently, just uh, moments before I got on uh, this afternoon, we've learned that one of our reserve officers with the police department uh, has in fact tested positive. That is even a, a more limited exposure for a number of reasons. Uh, this time of year, we're not using them uh, much at all. Uh, and so we've, uh, we've done similar contact tracing. It was a lot easier process given um, his involvement with our organization over the last couple of weeks. Uh, so I guess the, the point is, it is among us. Uh, it should come as no surprise. Uh, Scarborough School uh, had an incident last weekend as well. So I think uh, we are redoubling all of our efforts here at Town Hall, uh, just in terms of all the, the protocols that, that we should know well and by heart by now. Uh, but with increased activity at Town Hall, with uh, early voting, uh, we really need to be hyper vigilant. Uh, and I encourage all of us to to uh, to 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 follow the the basic protocols that I hope have become second nature. Uh, again, I'll keep you updated, um, and I think we'll, we'll certainly do our part uh, as we can report out um, as things develop to the community as well. With respect to voting. Um, just a quick couple of uh, statistics here you might find interesting. So far, as of five o'clock this afternoon, uh, we have had a total of 7,758 ballots that have been requested and that we have actually issued to voters. And of those, uh, we've had 2,610 2, returned to us. And so we expect, obviously, that over the course of the next several weeks, uh, the rest of them will trickle in. Uh, I would remind you, we do have the ability to actually start scanning these, not tallying them, but scanning them uh, essentially a week before the election date. And I know Todi has already uh, made arrangements. I think she is expecting three days will be sufficient to be able to process those number of ballots. And based on our experience uh, last July, that, that does seem to be the case. So uh, as no great surprise, we are seeing um, heavier traffic than ever. In terms of early voting, and we expect that that will certainly continue right up through election day. A uh, quick report on our gap daycare. This is our first week of operation. Um, we still do have some spaces available. We frankly are pleased that we are not full. Uh, we're using this week to kind of sort through and uh, get our operation, um, you know, working well. Uh, keep in mind we have different cohorts. So today we had a new crop of students come through. And so uh, we'll be pleased to get a week uh, and, and have some time with each of the students that are part of this program. Uh, Councilor Gleistein was able to join us for a quick tour last night as were four or five members of the Board of Education as well. And I would certainly offer, there's an opportunity to any of you, um, if you wish to have a, a look at the facility, give me a call or Todd Susan, and we'll be pleased to make those arrangements and get you in to take a look. So, so far, so good is, would, would be the, the quick sentiment for me. Uh, as has been reported, the governor did issue a new executive order yesterday, so we're moving to so-called stage four of the reopening Maine's economy. Essentially, uh, this really affects bars and restaurants. Uh, this new executive order will become effective October 13th, but I think for all intents and purposes, November 2nd is the magical time when um, some of the restrictions are relaxed for bars and restaurants. Uh, I would note, uh, this coupled with some action you're considering later on this evening to extend your emergency ordinance to next spring, I hope will uh, allow uh, these establishments in town, uh, you know, a fighting chance to, to keep open and keep functioning through the winter months. A couple other points of interest, uh, the ad hoc, ad hoc committee process um, and timeline, I believe uh, Chairman Johnson has advised the council uh, about this, this time frame. Uh, we're still soliciting input. Uh, as of this afternoon, we have 14 uh, interested persons um, for the downtown group and six for the Charter Review Commission at this point. Um, we intend to keep solicitation open through November 6th, so there's still plenty of time. I think we'll do another kind of media blitz or, or a PR campaign, if you will, to regenerate some interest. Uh, and at this point, we're on tentative schedule to have the council meet in executive session at a special meeting on November 11th. 
to review applicants and to identify uh, potential appointments and for those appointments to ha happen at your next meeting on November 18th. So uh, I think we've got a good plan in place and uh, I'm very pleased with the quality and the caliber of the residents who've uh, expressed interest in serving on one. In many cases, uh, they've offered to serve on both. Last two pieces I'll share. Uh, we were approached earlier this week. Uh, the Scarborough Community Chamber, as you know, is the coordinator of our local candidates forum. Um, they have been approached by the League of Women Voters to hold a similar forum for House District 29 candidates. I'm not sure why they're focusing on that one. Uh, this will be a virtual event, um, so they're not using our facilities per se, but uh, th they're looking to model very closely. Kevin Freeman has agreed to uh, moderate the event, and I know Karen Martin is assisting on some of the technical support behind the scenes. Um, that forum is scheduled for Monday, this coming Monday, October 12th. Uh, 7 to 8 p.m. if you want to see it live. And lastly, we have worked uh, using CDC guidelines uh, recently issued for upcoming hol uh, holidays, in particular Halloween. Uh, you know, despite what many residents think, the town really, you know, doesn't dictate if and when or at all whether uh, Halloween will occur. We, we take a hands-off approach and this year is no different but for the fact that uh, we're in different times and we, we certainly have an obligation to, to remind people of what the recommended uh, guidelines and procedures are. And so we've put together uh, a number of communication pieces that will be going out this week through the police department um, around just how to be safe and, and, and enjoy your Halloween um, coming up. Uh, there's also guidance for uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. I think we'll do things as those dates get closer though. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's my report for this evening. I'm pleased to answer questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, any questions for Tom? Ken, did you get your, you asked a question last meeting about the election. Did he answer it? I can't quite remember what you asked. Was it the days that they can start, the days before they can start counting? And we said we would run it by Toady. I'll go back and look at the tape and, and get the answer if it's. I know Councillor Johnson had asked something about the elections and we all agreed we'd let Toady confirm it. And now I can't remember quite what it is. So I'll go back and look at it, but. Well, the, I will say the state has allowed uh, up to seven days uh, prior to the election for purposes of processing uh, early votes, uh, not tallying. This would be reading into the machines, but not seeing any of the results. Um, we don't think we need that much time. So we'll be using uh, three days prior to the election and ideally we would just be processing um, ballots received on election day, uh, on election day. So. Good, thank you, sir. Ken, I, I don't know if this will refresh anybody's memory, but I thought it related to um, what we did with post, you, returns that were, that were received after the election. If we went by the postmark date or um, if they had to be actually in our possession on uh, election night. I think the response at the time was that we had to receive them by eight o'clock Yes, and I've verified that's the case. Okay. Postmark doesn't matter. It must be re received at the polling place uh, by 8, 8 p.m. Incidentally, we have a protocol in place with a box out front here. We'll be checking and collecting ballots that are received here at 8. Uh, we'll be actually physically removing that ballot box uh, promptly at 8 o'clock to ensure that no additional ballots are delivered. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, John. I knew, I knew it was on top of my head. I couldn't quite remember. So. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, with yep. that, we're going to go to resolutions, uh, excuse me, resolution 20002. It's an act on the request to approve resolution 2002, standing in solitary, solidarity against racial and social injustice. Um, Councilor Katarina is going to offer up an explanation. Uh, Jean Marie, I'll then, I'll project it on the screen and then you can read it after you give your explanation. Uh, okay, or I have it right here in front. Yeah, I'll just, while you read it, I'll put it up so people can see it. And then oh. we'll go to, we'll go to public comment before we put it on the floor. So with that, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the town council and public. Um, I'm very pleased to offer this resolution uh, regarding um, standing against racial and social injustice. Uh, this started actually this summer. It was in August when I was approached by uh, Mr. Dennis Meehan, who's the president of the local chamber of commerce regarding uh, whether we wanted to get involved with a statement 
uh, that they were putting out through the chamber that several large businesses were signing on to. At the time I was on vacation. Um, so I, I had a great conversation with Dennis uh, and I asked him you know, to please contact uh, Mr. Johnson or, or Mr. Hamill at that point. Um, <clears throat> of course, if, I don't know what people remember, it's been a whirlwind, but we've been very, very busy um, at town council with a number of initiatives, getting caught up from COVID and whatever. So it got a little lost and I, I take some responsibility for, for that also. However, that being said, <clears throat> when I've talked to uh, a few of our fellow counselors, um, we felt that given the time frame, August to now, it, it would make more sense for us to have our own statement that we came up with as a council. So I, um, I want to thank, <clears throat> excuse me, Councilor Gleistein. Uh, apparently, um, she had a friend of hers drafted uh, what I felt was a very well drafted um, resolution for us to use. And I was very happy to put this forward. I will explain to folks that if you went, excuse me, went on to the town council site, uh, maybe when it was first posted, we did have the chamber um, resolution up there as a placeholder waiting for this one to come in. So if anyone's confused about that, please don't be. Um, but here is, the, and, I, and I just wanna make one personal statement here. I am the aunt to a very uh, proud young black man who lives in Chicago. And then when I have been with him in Chicago over the years, um, I have witnessed firsthand um, behavior on the part of others in authority who not realizing that I was his aunt, God help them, right? Um, picked on him or made statements to him or accused him of things um, with me right there. So this is, this is near and dear to me. So I'm dedicating this to my uh, nephew, Samora Nesbitt, who now is a, a doctor in Chicago. So um, here we go. Resolution 20002, standing against racial and social injustice. Be it resolved by the Council of the Town of Scarborough, Maine, in town council assembled that, whereas we are living through a transformational time, Maine towns and communities are part of a global movement to address systemic racism and improve the quality of life, access to opportunities, and economic inclusion for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And whereas we understand that when it comes to racial and social justice, silence is not an option. We recognize that we have a responsibility to advocate for positive change and demonstrate our commitment to racial equity in our areas of influence. We condemn racism in any form, have zero tolerance for discrimination, and pledge to participate in authentic dialogues about race, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And whereas we will advocate for positive change and focus on the critical work of anti-racism, whereas we commit to continuously evaluating our own practices to ensure they live up to these values and standards and to educating all citizens and our municipal employees regarding racism and social inequity and its negative impacts with openness humility and respect, we can learn from each other and from the community where we live and work. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town council encourages our community to join us as we support and promote racial and social equity, equity throughout Scarborough and signed and sealed the seventh day of October, et cetera. So I, I put that forward. Thank you, Jean-Marie. Uh, before I think before we put it forward, we'll have public comment, right? Yeah. And then, so any members of the public like to speak? I'm just gonna go on down the line, everybody. So Mr. Anderson, you are going to be first. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, John, yep. Great, uh, John Anderson, Owens Way. Uh, first, I wanna thank Councillor Katerina and Gleistein, it sounds like for working this resolution together. 
I think it's great. And I think it's taken the pledge that was previously brought forward and, and actually made it better. So I really appreciate that. While some believe uh, racial equity is a national or political issue, many other residents and I see it as a moral one and one that merits a local response from our town. At a local level, I believe we have a responsibility to commit to positive change and improve inclusion, access to opportunities, and quality of life for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Systemic racism may impact how our town responds to coronavirus, how we approach development and growth, what we include in our ordinances, and the decisions we make about our schools. It's important to me that our town deliberately and consciously removes both covert and obvious forms of racism from our local government and strive to create a more inclusive Scarborough. Scarborough is not immune to racism, and now is the opportune time to reflect and have an open and honest discussion and ask how can we be better in Scarborough. Agreeing to this resolution is a great first step. It commits to me that our town will address racial inequities, um, and symbolically it affirms for me that our town leaders are committed to advance equity and fairness in Scarborough regardless of age, gender, socioeconomic status, ability, and in this case, race. I hope you are all unanimous in your support tonight and hope that there will be more steps to come from this council and the next to further advance equity in Scarborough. Um, quickly, I just wanna address the, the other resolution that's on, the, on for tonight, and I think it's great as well. Um, I would just suggest that the council consider maybe uh, in the future, considering a resolution for our teachers and school staff who are also putting themselves and, and their health and safety at risk. Um, I think it's great to recognize the work by the public safety workers, but I think there's an opportunity there as well. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, Brandy, you are up next. Thank you. Uh, my name is Randy Hogan. I live in Ocean View Harbor. I'm guided by my faith um, that calls me to strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. And that's why I'm so pleased to hear Councilor Katerina read the resolution for standing against racial and social injustice. Scarborough is a really wonderful place to live, learn, work, and play. And I love that part of what we stand for as a community is, uh, and I'll quote from the comprehensive plan, to ensure a great quality of life for all residents by providing strong livable neighborhoods where residents can build relationships in a safe, attractive, and healthy environment. This resolution is a public statement that our community stands for what's good for all of us, that we condemn racism in any form, and that we are actively working to achieve racial equity. Now I get that some feel that racial justice may not seem like it's an urgent local concern, that it's more of an issue for the national level or in big cities, or that maybe because Maine's a predominantly white population, we might think we don't really need to address racism here. But in fact, racial injustice is a sad reality in Maine. Uh, for example, we now know that Maine has the nation's worst COVID-19 racial disparity. Uh, that's due to long-standing inequities in healthcare and infrastructure and other critical services that contributed to this and other disparities. And I've also been alarmed to hear about instances of directly harmful actions that have popped up in other towns here in Maine. So if our community is to move forward to achieve opportunity and quality of life for all our neighbors, then we must include all of our neighbors. As an aside, of course, all lives should matter, but all lives won't matter until all lives matter. Black lives, indigenous lives, lives of people of color, where every single person in Scarborough has equal opportunity and the ability to participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. You know, there's a lot that's worn us down over these last few months, a global pandemic, economic troubles, political strife, deep divisions. Uh, by signing on to this resolution, though, the town council is leading us forward. By signing on to this resolution, you're taking steps to bring us together at a time when we need community more than ever. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. And up next is Ms. Tarpinian. You are up. Thank you. You're 
My name is Rayla Terpinian. I am on, live on Bonnie Grove Drive, and I am the mom of two Black Scarborough residents. I urge you to pass this resolution. I am very proud of the leadership shown by this council, and thank you for deciding to stand up and acknowledge the harm of racism and recognize that remaining silent is not an option. Until we challenge the systems that allow racism to flourish, we will not be able to progress. And I look forward to see what actions you uh, perform to follow up this statement. And I simply wanna read the statement of something that struck me, which is from Ujoma Oalia. It's, she says that as long as racism exists to ruin the lives of countless people of color, it should be something that upsets us. But it uh, upsets us because it exists, not because we talk about it. And if you are white and you don't feel any pain by having these conversations, then you're asking people of color to continue to bear that entire burden of racism alone. So thank you for making that road a little less lonely. Thank you very much. Ms. Rowan, you are up next. And Aaron, like usual, you're gonna be a panelist, so I'll have to turn your camera off. Okay, you're all set. <clears throat> okay, um, so I will not be nearly as eloquent as my across the street neighbor, Frayla Tarpinian, um, because I just finished cooking pancakes and it's been a really <laughs> wild and crazy day around here. Um, I'd like to echo what Frayla said actually, and um, also thank the town council for taking it upon yourselves to draft a, a resolution separate from what the Chambers of Commerce um, drafted. I think that's a really important and um, wise choice, especially since many of the policies that, that Chambers of Commerce nationally lobby for are, are racist um, and reinforce white supremacy across our country. So kudos to you for, for starting over and making your own resolution. I think it's much meaningful that way. Um, I, it, the wording is fantastic. I hope that all of you vote to, to approve the resolution this evening. Um, and I hope you really take the, the ideas to heart that um, this, is, this is something that should be in the back of your minds for every single decision you make as a, a human and especially as a, as a elected official. Um, in Scarborough. So um, I think somebody mentioned like our, our housing policies, our growth policies, all of the things that you'll be taking upon yourselves as you hopefully pass the comprehensive plan sometime in the not too distant future. Um, every single time you act, I would um, hope that you will take the words that you're approving tonight to heart. Um, like John Anderson said, I. I wish that this wasn't being followed by the resolution that, that is following it. And I would encourage you to, as your first action in support of the resolution that hopefully is about to pass, to take the other one right off um, the agenda tonight. I think it's highly inappropriate. Um, in the current context, um, it all sounds wonderful. And had I read it five years ago, I would have thought it was perfect. But in the current context, it's really inappropriate to follow um, a resolution like the racial justice one with something about, um, we also love public safety people. I mean, I, I don't think, I don't know what, what the, what's behind the timing and why this decision was made to, to have them in tandem. Um, but if part of your thinking was um, to reassure public safety that because Black Lives Matter, um, it doesn't mean you don't think Blue Lives Matter too. I think that you can all rest assured that um, that our chief has totally understand that, that Black Lives Matter and he doesn't need you to say Blue Lives Matter too. Um, because we have Operation Hope, um, because he advocated to have a social worker present in the police station, um, in order to help people access services instead of um, wanting to arrest everybody for every single thing they do. I don't think the following resolution is necessary. And like I said, I hope you just take it right off the agenda for this evening. Thank you for your time. 
Thanks, Aaron. <clears throat> And I'll pause for a second. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to speak to this issue? Anybody? Okay, uh, with that, I think I'm looking for a motion. So Councilor Katarina, I'll let you put it on the table or the- uh, Yes, yeah, so moved. And is there a second? Second. And discussion, opening it up to discussion. Councillor Cucci? Yeah, nice work pulling this together, Councillor uh, Katarina and Glystein and, and whoever um, in the public was involved. I, um, I, I think this is a local statement that um, you know, we stand together against uh, racial and social injustice. And, uh, and it's a first step. And you, know, you, you don't have to do anything more than look at the screen right now to see that we don't have a very diverse uh, mix um, and some of these uh, issues are deep rooted um, and historic and they are not so solved overnight, but you have to start somewhere. And I think this is a, um, uh, as good a place as any to start. And I'd love to see us become a, a more representative and diverse council, but that you can't just make that happen overnight. So um, if anybody uh, is looking for support, um, in getting elected to office. Uh, I, I think that's something that a minimum that I would be willing uh, to offer and, and, and try to give some guidance to. Um, but beyond that, I think that this statement is a great first start and thank you for pulling it together. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hamill? Yes, I'd just like to uh, say that I support this and I want to thank the the folk, my counterparts on the council for for doing some work to make sure that this is something that flows from you know a higher level statement but is is something that is uniquely our own. And I think that our challenges are are also unique in the state of Maine for a variety of reasons. But I think some of the folks in the public have mentioned that. You know, we uh, we have uh, actually some you know, some of our problems are are worse than other states, and um, and our representation is low. And I think that there's a a higher bar for us to to try to get over in terms of our raising our understanding and awareness and committing to the real work that needs to be done and that we all need to be part of. So I uh, support this completely and like the work that we've done to make it our own and look forward to the work that's ahead and the activities and the dialogue that was referenced. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Hamill. Any others? Councilor Gleistein? Uh, yes, I think we've had uh, several thanks and I want, want to thank uh, Councilor Katarina. Um, I think this came together very well uh, through the efforts of a number of folks. Um, you know, uh, you know, when I, I look at these things, um, I'm constantly challenging myself as an individual um, to understand my own thinking and to um, engage, uh, listen, research, um, understand uh, what, how these transformational times, as the topic said, are impacting people and what we can do. Um, I had an interesting uh, situation and one of the reasons I started thinking about this so much is, you know, I've, I've found myself looking to history. Um, there was a recommended book uh, for my daughter this year, uh, that was the autobiography of Booker T. Washington called Up From Slavery. Um, it's, it's astounding to go back in history and to see where we've come from um, and how much we have not achieved and how much we, you know, what we have achieved and what, what still needs to be achieved. And uh, there's, a, there's an introduction um, in that book edited uh, by me in part, but I, I think it's important to think about it and to hear about it. Um, this was written by a, name, a man named Walter Page, uh, who was invited by Booker T. Washington. And if you don't know who he was, he was 
uh, extraordinary man, uh, born into slavery, an author, an educator, a statesman, a founder of Tuskegee Institute, um, and many other accomplishments that he achieved under extraordinary uh, circumstances. I think one of the things that, uh, rereading this book that I'd read in my childhood that came back to stun me was he's describing the scene of when uh, it's announced where he lives that uh, slaves will be free. And there was so much joy. Uh, people were so happy. And then within a short amount of time, the burden of what that freedom meant to them um, became a very, very, very serious for them. Um, and it, it, it really has become, it stayed that in terms of our entire history of our country. And in 1901, uh, Walter Page, again, kind of edited my version, wrote um, this uh, when he was giving, after when he was doing this introduction where Booker T. Washington had invited him, a white man, to speak to um, a thousand Tuskegee Institute students. He said, I found myself thinking of that long and unhappy chapter in our country's history, which followed the great structural mistake of the founders of the Republic, thinking of the one continuous great problem that generations of statesmen had wrangled over and a million men fought about. The whole Republic was a victim of that fundamental error of slavery. Every effort of philanthropy seemed to have been miscarried. Every effort at correcting abuses seemed of doubtful value and the race frictions seemed to become severe. I had long ago thrown aside illusions and theories and was willing to meet the facts face to face and do whatever in God's name a man might do towards saving the next generation from such a burden. But I felt the weight of hopeless years of thought and reading and observation for the old difficulties remained and the new ones had sprung up. But indeed he did find hope. Uh, Mr. Washington found hope and I, I challenge us to say what he said, are we willing to meet the facts face to face and do whatever in God's name that we might do to save the next generation from such a burden? Um, so I'll be supporting this resolution tonight um, and uh, I thank you for the time. Thank you, Councilor Gleistein. Any others? No, okay. Um, I guess my remarks are, I don't think I can say it any better than Ms. Hogan, Ms. Rowan, Ms. Tarpinian, and Mr. Anderson. Uh, thank you all four for speaking today. I think you actually hit the nail right on the head and, and, and said it better than we could. I don't know what this means for the council as a body moving forward. I'm not going to pretend what it, that I know what it means. Um, but Ms. Rowan, I think you, you, it really, it speaks to me when you say, you know, what it will be in the back of my mind, it will be in the front of my mind when we're making these decisions that are seemingly small town Scarborough and mundane decisions, there are implications in the background um, with this issue. So I appreciate you bring, bringing that thought to us because I completely and wholeheartedly agree. So um, with that, I think I will take a vote. Uh, Mr. Hall? Councilor Clucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? <clears throat> yes. Councilor Gleistein. Yes. Councilor Katarina. Yes. Councilor Johnson. Yes. Councilor Hamill. Yes. Chairman Johnson. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Uh, next on the agenda is, and I will, I'll do it the same exact way. I'll let Betsy uh, talk about it. I'll put it on the screen for Betsy to read, and then we'll take public comment, and then we'll put it on, on the floor. Uh, so with that, that's resolution 2003, which is an act on the request to approve resolution 2003, recognizing the service, professionalism, and contributions of the Scarborough public, uh, public safety workers. And with that, uh, Councillor Gleistein, I'll share the screen when you're ready, but I'll let you um, tee it up. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so I uh, sponsor this resolution. I appreciate um, John Anderson's comments. Um, it, it was very difficult to write because as I started uh, writing it, you know, there are so many people to thank uh, and to recognize through these extraordinary and transformational times and the, the, the people that have put themselves um, on the front lines, uh, protecting our rights, um, as well as protecting our health and well being. And so um, I wanted to recognize one set of those people today, which is our public safety workers. 
um, with this resolution. Um, and I think the suggestion of um, John Anderson that perhaps we consider some of these going forward. Again, I, I could not, uh, you know, every, even as I was writing and I was thinking, oh, and this is what town staff did and this is what other people did. Um, and uh, so, so this is a start um, and I hope people can support it. Okay, I'm sorry, let me share <laughs> how to adjust my seat. Okay, there you go. So be it resolved by the council of the town of Scarborough, Maine in town council assembled that whereas Scarborough public safety workers have throughout the pandemic, even in the face of uncertainty during the early days served and protected the residents of Scarborough with compassion and professionalism. And they demonstrated solidarity with our community by volunteering to make fiscal concessions during economically challenging times. And the Scarborough police department, I'll call SPD, manages Operation Hope, a grant funded program that has helped provide treatment for over 410 people suffering from substance abuse disorders in the greater Portland area. And where staff at all levels works as a team with the SPD social services navigator to assist residents struggling with a variety of quality of life issues outside of law, law enforcement. And whereas SPD officers can consistently keep our neighborhoods and businesses safe, enforce our laws, protect the rights of all individuals, respond in times of crisis, and defend the innocent at risk of injury, disability, or even death without a single use of force complaint lodged in at least the last 20 years. And whereas the Scarborough Public Safety Leadership is easily accessible in person, by phone, or by email, and welcomes questions and input from residents. And leadership ensures all employees receive consistent training, to achieve top level qualifications in order to maintain the highest standards in all aspects of public safety while requiring individual accountability to deliver excellent public service. And whereas public safety employees participate and contribute to numerous community support efforts, such as fundraising for Project Grace, Operation Kind, which is our kid in need of de-escalation de program and coffee with a cop, and whereas they contribute numerous hours of individual volunteer, <clears throat> as individual volunteers to local organizations as valued members of our community, and they provide key support to other communities throughout Maine and beyond, despite potential risks to their personal safety. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Town Council of Scarborough, Maine voices its continued support and recognizes the service and professionalism of all Scarborough public safety employees law enforcement, fire, EMS, dispatch, and support staff for upholding justice, defending the rule of law, and safeguarding our health, well-being, property, and even our lives. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'm going to take public comment. Oh, no. With that, I'll take public comment. And I'll pause for a second, see if anybody's raising their hand. Uh, Ms. Rowan, I will bring you in. And again, uh, Aaron, your camera will be on, so let me turn it off when you come in. Oh, it's good, actually. You're good. Hi. <clears throat> Sorry. I just wanted to reiter reiterate what I said before, since there were no other public comments for this resolution, um, that I, I would just like you to either table it or take it off for tonight. Um, and I think the the piece that was read toward the end about um, justice, um, we can't really claim that that we're upholding justice when we, we don't have racial justice, we don't have disability justice, we don't have justice for, you know, black indigenous people of color. Um, so even for that line alone, um, I would, I would say let's revisit this at a later time or just, you know, find a better time to talk about um, this issue. Uh, because I think it kind of negates the previous resolution, whether the whether that was intentional or not. That's, the, that's what I'm hearing tonight. And um, I think I'm not alone in hearing that. Thank you. Thank you. I will pause to see if there's anybody else. I don't.
apparently there is. So with that, I will let Betsy put this on the floor, I believe. So moved. And is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you. And discussion? Anything? Councillor Katarina? Yeah, um, since I was the, the one who brought forward the uh, staying as racial and social injustice um, statement, you know, I, I have to say that I, while I understand uh, Ms. Rowan's concern with the juxtaposition of the two statements, um, given if you're looking at the national dialogue, but one of the things that we are doing here in Scarborough is we are looking at Scarborough and where we're at in Scarborough. And I'll tell you right now that if this were about the Chicago Police Department, no way in heck would I be supporting this. However, um, over the years that I've lived in Scarborough, um, I've seen nothing but great uh, work with the community uh, from our police. We very much have a community-oriented police department and I give Chief Moulton great credit for that. So I certainly don't see bringing forward both of these resolutions as something that's mutually exclusive. Um, and, and again, I hear what uh, Ms. Rowan is saying and I, I understand where she's coming from. But in this specific case, I, I can support this being here. So that, that's all I wanted to say. Councilor Kluge? Yeah, I, I echo what Councillor Katarina said there. I, I think um, it, as counselors, we're, we've all been a little sensitive. We, uh, while we want to participate in the national dialogue, we want to be specific to Scarborough in our work. And I think that this actually brings balance to the conversation here. I think our um, public safety workers have been fantastic and progressive and um, kind of paving the way or helping to show what might be the future of, of that domain. So I I felt it appropriate to recognize that given some of the discourse that's been out there, um, uh, you know, over the topic. So um, I, I do support this and I, I don't think that it takes anything away from uh, the, the previous resolution. I, I think it helps to show where we are in Scarborough. Thank you, Councilor Katarina. I mean, sir, I'm sorry, Councilor Gleistein, sorry. Yeah, I really can't say anything better than uh, what John and, uh, uh, Jean Marie said, um, you know, certainly no intent to denigrate the other one. Um, but I do think, as John said, we do, and Katarina uh, and uh, Jean Marie said, we, we, we do have uh, really a lot of programs and forward thinking in our police department and our public safety in general, just from the standpoint of how much they work together and how we have a public safety that, you know, is not territorial, but but works together for the good of Scarborough. Um, it's, it's, uh, that does not always happen in every town, I can tell you that. So, um, you know, I really can't add to what they say, except that I was hoping to just give a little recognition to some of the accomplishments and things that are out there and maybe whet people's appetite because not everything can be included in a one page resolution to finding out more and especially reaching out on your own uh, to talk to our leadership if you have questions and concerns. I, I can't speak highly enough of, of uh, th how open they are to uh, meeting with people, talking with people and taking feedback and making changes and making uh, our, our departments even better than they already are. And I know our town manager does the same thing. So that's not to leave Tom out, but in particular, um, you know, it, it isn't every town that you can go to and say, oh, I can pick up the phone and talk to the police chief. He's gonna meet me down in the park or the fire chief because I have these concerns. Uh, we are very, we are extremely fortunate. Um, and I, I just wanted to highlight some of that. Thank you. Councillor Hayes. Yeah, I, mean, I think I'll just echo what has been so eloquently said. I, I think we're very fortunate. I think it is, this is a Scarborough specific sort of resolution we've been working on this evening. I happen to think our whole public safety, and it's just not the police, it, it's rescue. My, my in-laws, unfortunately, have had several encounters with the medical personnel, and we are very fortunate to have the, the professionals serving us in this town the way they have. So I think it's a great balance to the evening. I don't think they necessarily conflict with each other. 
Um, so I will be supporting it also. Thank you, sir. Any others? Tom? Oh, sorry, Tom, would you like to take the vote, please? Certainly. Councillor Clucci? Yes. Councillor Hayes? Yes. Councillor Gleistein? Yes. Councillor Katarina? Yes. Councillor Johnson? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. And Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Okay, with that, we're on to the tough resolution, resolution 2004, on the request to approve resolution 2004 regarding MMA workers' compensation safety initiative program, incentive program, excuse me. Uh, so Tom, I'll let you explain what this is. Yes, uh, for a number of years, uh, for the number of years the town has participated in the so-called leader program, it's, uh, it was the, the predecessor to this new workers' comp um, safety incentive program and in doing so, we're able to save some fairly significant money on our uh, on reduced uh, workers' comp premiums. Members of finance committee and perhaps members of council may recall in this last budget cycle, uh, we've seen a, uh, a, a, a very large increase in our workers' comp costs. And so whatever we can do, we need to do to reduce those costs. So this is a resolution required of the, uh, of the uh, insurance trust. And so we strongly encourage you to uh, pass it this evening, and we will go about the business of uh, really adhering to the program uh, for any number of reasons, including the financial benefits that, that will accrue. Thank you. Do I have a motion? So moved. Any, any discussion? Okay. Tom, would you like to uh, call the vote, please? Certainly. Councilor Clucci. Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to mute every, we are getting some feedback, so I'm going to mute everybody when they're not speaking, so I apologize. Um, that is not some sort of power grab on my end, please. <laughs> but what is a power grab is I'm going to call a recess until 8.05 if there is no objection. So we can actually, let's do, is 8.05 a little too long or is 8.05 okay? Is that, is that okay? All right, so I will call a recess to 8.05 and we'll reconvene that.
Peter, I'm just going to turn your screen off because on YouTube you're the you're the whole screen right now because you're the only camera on. So I'm just going to turn your camera off while we're recessing. Is this any better, Paul? Yeah, it is. You're you've been a little inconsistent, so it's kind of hard to figure out. Yeah, I, I like, think I might have been double connected at one point. You know, on both of, so it may have been a reason for an echo. Yeah, the only thing that helps me is I don't know if you notice, like a lot of people, especially if you have time or spectrum, um, your wireless yeah. networks will say five G and then two G after them. Yeah, typically two G is better for most devices right now. Um, so that's the only thing that helps me. That's my little advice, but 5G works with like a lot of really newer devices, but it has less of a range and 2G yeah. has more. So like right now I'm upstairs, so I have to use 2G or I get spotty. So, yep. but no, you've been a little bit inconsistent all night. I don't know if it's the room or, but. Yeah, I don't know. I've tried everything. It's, it's relatively new. We just kind of did some upgrades yesterday. So yeah, like right now you sound fine. So, okay. Tell, tell the rest of your family members to get off their computers. I don't think there's anybody else on there. It's impossible. <laughs> yeah. I think Betsy's lost. In, uh... Betsy, I'm going to assume you're coming in under your husband's name, and I'll change your name. Tom, is Tony still at the at town hall? She was just wrapping up the final audit just yeah. now. Yeah. So what does the audit entail? She cross references like who's voted with who they thought voted or how does, is that what that is? Like they look yeah. at the envelope versus the check marks? Yeah, they've got to catalog it all in on a daily basis so we know which ones were received. So yeah, we, yeah. it's a, a tremendous safeguards. It just is a, there's a lot of work. Yeah. And did she do it by herself or is there a couple of them or? Oh, she has a, a small team. Yep. Yeah. 
And then there's always, always a handful of ballots that they need to so-called cure. Yeah. Uh, they're missing one thing or another. So there'll be some follow-up first thing in the morning and she's able to cure almost all of them. Nice. Yep. I assume that's things like people forgetting to sign the back of the envelope is a big one. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. If they hand deliver, we'll catch those, but if they drop right. in the box. Right. You know, Betsy, I'm sorry. I, I promoted Eric because I thought you had just come in under a different connection. I'm sorry. I'm going to just call Betsy real quick. I think we're having some trouble, so give me one second. Enough. Are you out uh, walking your dog? Yeah, I'm glad I have a well-trained dog. <laughs> and I taught him a very specific command. That's good. That's good. Go, boy. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested, I went with uh, chicken stuffing and mashed potato during the recess. <laughs> I'm really good at eating large dinners in very short periods of time. All right. If I didn't get my camera off, maybe. Yeah, let me put you back on. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I just I turned you off because you were just on. You were the only one on YouTube, so I just. Oh, no worries. Yeah. Does that work? Did it ask you to? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Ow. And Betsy, can you hear me? I'm trying to get Betsy connected. I'm just having a hard time. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. We're good. All right. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I may not. Sorry. I may not have the camera, but I can hear you. Okay. All right. Then we're good to go. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Sorry for the trouble. No. No. Not at all. Um, all right. So welcome back, everybody. We are reconvening uh, the October seventh, twenty twenty, town council meeting of Scarborough, Maine, and we are on. on excuse me. We are on to order number twenty zero seven eight. It's a seven p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to chapter 1301, the general assistant ordinance pursuant to title 22 MRSA 4305. Um, and Tom, I'll let you explain this to us. Yes, uh, annually we are required to update our uh, maximum reimbursement uh, amounts through uh, for general assistance. This is a matter of statute. Uh, we really have no local control. Um, and so I recommend you, uh, you adopt this this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion? So moved. Uh, public hearing first. Oh, oh I'm sorry. sorry. You're right. I got my, I get my order screwed up. Uh, is there anybody? Thank you, Tom. Is there anybody in the public that'd like to speak? I don't think there is. Okay. Um, so moved. Katarina? So moved. And second. I'm sorry. Did somebody second it? I'm sorry. Yes. Second. Uh, discussion? Okay, Tom, would you like to call the vote? Certainly. Councilor Clucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. And Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, order number 2079 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and a second reading on the proposed amendments to chapter 302, Scarborough Town Council Rules and Policy, section 100.0, Council Rules of Order, subsection 107.0 agenda. Uh, Betsy, you wanna just let us know what this is about? I'm sorry, I, I don't have my, um, is it this a charge? I don't have the agenda right in front of me. No, this is I. This is just the order of the the agenda for Tom's uh, report. Oh yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, people might have noticed that Councillor uh, Hamill for every meeting actually um, changes the agenda to put the town manager's uh, 
comments at the front and uh, before all the business. And um, uh, I think as a council, we've generally uh, liked that uh, having to hear from Tom early so that if people wanted to hear from the town manager, they don't have to stay for the entire meeting. Um, seems like it's been working well in practice. And so, um, and the rules, the rules uh, committee, we are proposing that it be made a permanent change. Um, we did kind of, I did in the interim kind of reach out to the chair and the co-chair and say, you know, do you want this like um, to be you can do it if you want or you don't or not do it and they're like no no this is where it works let's do it so i think um that's at least uh, the three of us and the two of them that support this i haven't touched base with other counselors but i think it's worked well in practice um, so hopefully people will want to support this change tonight thank you very much uh is there any public hearing just to summarize we're just changing the way the agenda is worked so uh the council uh town manager's report is on the top of the agenda I don't think there's anything from the public. So uh, Betsy, would you like to put it on the floor, please? So moved. And a second. Second. Oh, perfect. All sorts of support. Good discussion. <laughs> 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 Councillor Johnson and then Councillor Hamill. Yeah, I just, I think this is a great uh, point of, of, of learning for the folks that don't understand parliamentary government to take a very small thing that Councillor Don Hamill has had to do everything and actually go through a process to move it up in order on, on a policy and then go through, is this the second meeting? Yeah. Yep. So, and actually two meetings with a public comment. So you can just imagine some of the bigger issues, <laughs> why it takes a much longer time. So I just thought I'd call that out, but I do support it because we love hearing from our town manager. Thank you. Councillor Hamill. <laughs> As much as I'm going to miss the opportunity to speak at each meeting, I'm uh, fully support this process improvement. I think it'll be well received and uh, make us very efficient. Thank you. Any others? Councillor Johnson, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Something so simple it took us, I believe, six weeks. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is this is small, but it's big at the same time. I think the the town manager's report deserves to be front and center and. Um, it, I think it puts, it puts a highlight where it belongs. And I think if you're somebody that tunes into council meetings and turns it off halfway through because it's a little on the dull side, at least you're getting the appropriate stuff up front. So um, I support this as well. So Tom, would you like to call the vote? Certainly. Councilor Clucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Hamill? Yes. And Chairman Johnson? Yes. Okay, uh, with that, I have um, order number 2084, which is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the renewal requests for junkyard permits pursuant to Title 30A MRSA Chapter 183. This is for Goldstein Steel Company Incorporated, located at 36 Running Hill Road, A. Gagning, A. Gagning or E. Perry Iron, Iron and Metal, located at Rigby Road, Speedway Auto, located at 343 Payne Road, and SVR New England LP DBA Scarborough Recycling, located at 40 Holmes Road. And that's formerly uh, Scarborough Auto Parts right there on Holmes Road. And this is sponsored by the town clerk. So, Tom, I think I'll let you sponsor it. Certainly, these are all existing uh, automobile graveyards uh, or junkyards. They do require annual um, licenses or permits, rather. Uh, we have been out and inspected all four locations, and the code officer reports that uh, everything is in compliance. So we do recommend that you approve these, these permits this evening. Thank you. And before we do anything further, is there any public comment on this issue? Gonna pause for one second. I don't think there is. So with that, um, do I have it on? Can somebody make a motion, please? So moved. Second. Discussion. Tom. Councilor Clucci. Yes. Councilor Hayes. Yes. Councilor Gleistein. Yes. Councilor Katarina. Yes. Councilor Johnson. Yes. Councilor Hamill. Yes. 
Chairman Johnson. Yes. Uh, just before we go into the next order, just a point of clarification. There's there's two batches of marijuana establishment licenses here. This first batch is a public hearing only. And then the second batch is our actual approval. Just to, if you're at home or even for our own benefit, um, first one's the public hearing only. The second batch, we've already had the public hearing on them, our last meeting, and we're approving them. Um, so here we go. Order number 20085. It's a 7 p.m. public hearing only on the new request for the following marijuana establishment licenses and schedule final approval for Wednesday, October 21st, 2020. This is for ZGE Botanicals LLC, located at 4 Commercial Road for adult marijuana cultivation faculty, uh, facility, excuse me, and Daily Provider LLC, located at 4 Commercial Road for medical marijuana cultivation facility, and uh, Gove Street Collective LLC, located at 10 Snow Canning Road for medical marijuana cultivation facility and Darago Enterprise LLC located at 137 Pleasant Hill Road for medical marijuana cultivation facility. So this is no action on our end. This is just a public hearing. Um, did Jay want to speak to these? I assume that everything is in order. The, everything is in order. Uh, inspections were uh, conducted today. Um, if, they're, if they're not fully in order, they certainly will be before you consider formal action uh, at your next meeting. It may be helpful, I can just update you. This is a bit of a fluid situation, but as of right now, we do have, uh, have received 27 applications and there were three or four other potential ones that were at least in conversation with. Um, of that 27, you've already granted six. There are seven on your agenda for uh, adoption this evening. Um, and the way things are shaping up, uh, we, we will likely have a total of five batches. So the ones that you're hearing for public hearing tonight is considered the batch three. And uh, the other ones are in queue to kind of come in right behind that for a total of five different groupings that will come ahead. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, any comments from the public? Actually, this is only a public hearing, so I'm only taking comments from the public. Okay, seeing none, I'm going to move on. We are now on to old business, which is order number 2077. It's an act to, uh, excuse me, on the new request for the following marijuana establishment license. Again, we had the public hearing for these last meeting. Uh, this is Coastal Maine Cannabis LLC located at 10 Snow Canning Road for medical marijuana cultivation facility. Shannon's Best Buds located at 10 Snow Canning Road for medical marijuana cultivation facility. Keith Diamond Industries located at 10 Snow Canning Road for medical marijuana cultivation facility. Noble Beverage Company located at 137 Pleasant Hill Road for adult use manufacturing facility. Peter Langwith located at 10 Snow Canning Road for medical marijuana cultivation facility. John Edward Jenkins, located at 10 Snow Canning Road for Medical Marijuana Cultivation Facility. Nicholas Fuhrer, uh, Fuhrer, excuse me, located at 10 Snow Canning Road for Medical Marijuana Cultivation Facility. Uh, Tom, you want to reiterate some of this? Uh, the only thing I'd add, just to remind Council and, and the public, um, I suspect folks on Snow Canning Road or in the vicinity are getting tired of, of getting letters from us, but uh, we, we continue as the license process requires to send a butter notices uh, every single time we get an application. So uh, I just want you to be assured that uh, that abutters uh, are being notified as these licenses are coming forward on a virtual continual basis at this point and will continue uh, until we're complete. So um, I'm not aware that we've received any uh, additional comment about these licenses and I, I am aware I, and I can report that they are all signed off uh, I do have the sign-off sheets. I think they were added to your agenda um, as well. Thank you, Tom. Um, before I take a motion, is there any members of the public that would like to speak to this? There is not. So is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? second. Thank you. Second. Any discussion? Uh, Councillor Johnson? Is Jay available? I believe he is. Yes, he is. His hand is up. Okay. Just have a couple questions for Jay. Yep, he's coming in. Yep. Okay. All right, Jay is in. Great. Thank you, Jay. I'm assuming that you are part of the review team that goes in to uh, ensure compliance. Is that correct? 
I'm actually not. Um, my department is the, the zoning administrator is part of that and the commercial code officer is, but I believe it's really quarterbacked out of the assistant manager's uh, office um, in a lot of ways. Okay, we'll strike that question. I'll follow up with another one. <clears throat> these are several of these licenses are for cultivation. Could you explain exactly what that means? Uh, growing. <laughs> okay, good enough. Don't, so, don't know if I can make it any more clear. <laughs> so somebody that's coming in for a cultivation license, that does not give them license to sell. Is that correct? Uh, I would, you know, I, I would ha hasten to answer from the hip. I would want to look at the definition um, just so I don't give you faulty information. Um, I, I believe I just, I could be somewhat helpful here, I think. Um, they certainly can sell, but not sell on a retail or consumer basis. Uh, they're growing their product and selling it to someone else who will process it or repackage it and sell it uh, with the proper credentials. But you are correct. Um, you are issuing licenses only for the approved activities, and they're not allowed to do anything other than the license allows them to. Many of them hold multiple licenses, depending on their lines of business. And in fact, I think we'll see some transition uh, from one business to another as this progresses. Okay, so selling, of course, would be limited to then maybe a dispensary or some other venue to disperse it. Correct. But selling directly to a customer, whether it be medical or recreational, is not allowed under these licenses, is that correct? No, the medical sales would be, but not retail sales. And, and, and there are regulations around um, you know, that activity under the medical sales um, aspects. So let me, then I'm confused and let me just rephrase the question. So selling directly to the public from the establishment is allowed in addition to selling to a dispensary? I, uh, I can, I can I, answer that sort of dangerously here. Having sat through and Dawn, I may get you to, um, the medical use can sell to their patients, so to speak. Um, and the patients, I'm, I'm not up on how they establish that now. The, what you're thinking of is uh, recreational use, marijuana. So they can't sell for recreational use at all, any of them who are defined as medical marijuana cultivation. Okay. Now, Does that I, sort of answer your question? Probably the way I asked it, you did, so thank you very much. I'm just trying to get a handle on Somebody knocks on my, I'm at 10 Snow Road. Somebody knocks on my door. They have a medical card. They're a very legitimate customer and you sell the product to them. That's where I'm trying to get to because to me, that's a retail establishment, even though it is medical marijuana directly to somebody that is compliant by the states for medical marijuana. So that was the question. Yeah, I can't answer that other than what I learned through the, our ordinance process was that medical is treated very differently. Okay. It's two different things and they're a little more, I hate to use the word liberal sort of with the medical, but it's longer standing, but Tom looks like he's going to jump in. Here. Okay. Cause you know, I can go over to South Portland. I can walk into right. several of the establishments right. and uh, they're a dispensary. And if I had a card, I could purchase product. So to me, that's retail sales of, med uh, of marijuana out of an establishment. So that's where I was just trying to ask, because yeah. if, if that's not allowed, I would just like to remind the people coming in for cultivation licenses that they should not be selling out of that establishment. That's we, it looks to me like we've got a couple of the guys or gals who own these businesses and John Burke's an attorney who represents them who's looking to jump in. Yeah, so. yeah before that, before we right. do that, I, I want to right. state Ken's question a little more bluntly. I think there's enough sufficient evidence that people are pulling around to the parking lot of 10 Snow Canning Road and buying marijuana directly out of the warehouses. Yeah, and so I, I think in, in, a, in a most likely, then they have a medical marijuana card. So to bluntly state it, Mr. Johnson, tell me if I'm stating this wrong, but I think it's pretty that the activity of driving into the parking lot getting marijuana from them directly is that allowed because i think that there's a few of us on the council that are pretty confident that that is happening 
So that's what happens when you try to dance around. Yes. Well, let me rip that Band-Aid off for you, Mr. Sir. And then, well, I'm going to defer to a couple of our attendees. I, and, and I will. I just want to make sure we get the answer to the question that's yeah. actually being asked. So, Mr. Burke and Mr. Jenkins, I'll let you respond to, are people driving into your parking lot and buying marijuana out of that parking lot? So, um, Mr. Burke first, go ahead. I don't know if you represent any of those guys, but I'll let you speak. So. John, are you there? Oh, can you hear me? I can hear you, John. Yep. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, well, first, I, I don't operate any facility, so I can't speak to what people are doing or not doing. But um, there is a distinct difference between adult use retail stores and medical caregivers. Um, something that actually needs to be worked on in the future is caregivers can not only grow medical marijuana, but they can also dispense medical marijuana to any person who has, is a qualified patient or a visiting qualified patient pursuant to the statute in the state of Maine. So a caregiver can dispense medicine to anyone who has a card uh, at their uh, facility. Uh, that is not considered a retail store, which is prohibited under Scarborough's current ordinance. Um, and then there's a, there is distinctions in the statute uh, that differentiate, differentiate between the two. Um, and to answer the question about sales in particular, Scarborough and every other community is prohibited by statute from prohibiting or limiting caregivers from operating in their community. Uh, and while there can be regulation, stopping a caregiver from dispensing probably would be in violation of that statute. Uh, so there are no, to my knowledge, no storefronts open in uh, Scarborough from a retail perspective, and certainly none by my clients that I represent. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I don't know if this is a Mr. or Mrs. Wall, perhaps. So. I'm all set. I just want—I just wanted to make sure that uh, that someone answered that question right, and he did. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. I, I have heard from the assistant town manager. Uh, he will provide uh, further clarity to all of you, uh, perhaps even later this evening. He just wasn't able to be here this uh, to partake in the discussion. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I. 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 Uh... Sorry to pipe in here, Paul. I'm, I don't have a, a video, um, but yeah, I think this does need clarification and understanding. the The law is complex. Uh, you know, maybe someday they'll change the law and and uh, put put the two sides together. Um, that's not where we are right now. There's really kind of a distinct set of laws that apply to medical marijuana, and then the retail. But I do know that there's um, law around dispensaries, so um, you know I do think we need to understand this better and make sure that. Um, and we all said, you know, we passed a marijuana ordinance that it probably would require tweaking, as I'm sure the the law will require tweaking because this is such a new industry um, all over the country and in Maine. So you know that we are our ordinance is accomplishing what we set out to do, which was to not have retail but then also to make sure that we're following, you know, whatever the state law allows. So um, I, I do look forward to getting clarification on this. And I'd like to thank um, Councillor Johnson for bringing this up. I, I, I'll just say, uh, maybe, hopefully not to confuse things, but a dispensary is in fact medical retail, which we do not permit. And the distinction Mr. Burke made is that for medical caregivers, that is, that is the activity that is allowed under Maine law. And, we do and not so at, at 10 Canning Road, then is that the address that all of the caregivers are giving as a part of their caregiver license or are they, are they, do they have offices other places? Uh, so do we have a lot of caregivers now established at 10 Canning Road? I can't, I'm sorry, I can't answer that, but I'm sure the assistant manager can and will uh, shortly. Okay. Yeah. And it's all as clear as mud. I don't, you know, I think, I think it's, mm -hmm. 
you know, it's a complicated set of laws. So there's no, you know, no ill intent on anyone's part here because it's a lot to understand and we'll just, we'll have to keep digging into it. So again, I, I, I thank uh, Councillor Johnson for bringing this forward. Well, and I think that's actually the question here. I think the question is, are, you know, are these guys that we're establishing as mar medical marijuana cultivation, are they also caregivers, right? We don't know, right? So when we have, when, when we have the typical traffic of cars coming in and out that are coming to the, let's say, you know, around to the warehouse opening and, and operating, getting their medical marijuana, I guess we don't even know which one of those are actually medical caregivers. Because I think right now I'm under operating under the cert assumption that I don't know, right? I, are none of them, right? Uh, John, I, John, I would assume, uh, Paul, that... that that's not changed, right? So some of this must have been happening before because the, the side of the law about medical marijuana, other than them having to get the license for it, which, you know, when the law passed, but a lot of that part of the law did not change. So perhaps this is not any kind of anything new. That would yeah, be- Yeah, totally. Yeah, I just, yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and John, I'm like, I'll let you, I'll, I'll, I'll keep breaking the rules in here and let you retort this. Go ahead, John. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, can you hear me again? Yeah, I'm, we can, I'm, yeah. I'm terrible with this, I apologize. You're doing uh, a great job. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, it, I, I understand there's some confusion, so let me, this might just be helpful for the council, um, and certainly we're talking to um, Liam, he could provide this as well. On the, on the medical side, there's caregivers, and those are what Scarborough calls medical cultivation licenses. Okay. So, I, something I think Scrubber should consider down the road is instead of calling medical cultivation licenses, call them medical caregiver licenses. It, it just it make it easier from a definition standpoint. But, um, and they have certain abilities pursuant to statute. There's also in medical, medical manufacturing facilities, that's a completely separate um, license the state issues. In fact, there's actually technically no license yet for them, even though they have the set of rules created. Uh, and so from a caregiver standpoint, um, they can do certain things, um, including dispensing the medicine. And I think Council, uh, Chairman Johnson, you are correct. I think it was Chairman Johnson, and I apologize if I'm wrong here. Dispensaries are actually something completely different. Um, there's only a limited number of dispensary licenses um, issued uh, by the state, um, and a majority of them are held by one company. So, uh, and that activity is correctly put prohibited in the town. Thank you. Thanks, John. That, that, that helps. So what, what I just heard you say just before you leave is these yep. medical marijuana cultivation facilities are caregivers. Correct. Okay. In fact, in fact, you must be a caregiver to be licensed as a med medical cultivator. Okay. Yeah. We'll get, and, we'll, and, and part of the application process is providing to the, to the town a copy of the caregiver card. So okay. in the file that you guys could review, you would see every card and it would say exactly what they can do. Did you just suggest we're not doing our homework, John? No, but I think you mentioned at one hearing, because I had been listening to all of them, uh, that uh, you guys can have the opportunity to take a look at the file if you so choose. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. All right, take care. Okay, um, any more discussion on that? I think the only thing I'll add is I've been on I've been in regular contact with a couple residents on snow uh, that um, about snow canning road I have been calling them on a at least um, bi weekly basis to check in and just give them updates on what we've been doing and how this process uh, rolls out so I have been uh, personally in contact with residents to try to um, just keep the dialogue open as we go through the first year of licensing so um, I kind of took it upon myself to be their contact for some of this but I just wanted to say that publicly because I think it's important that we maintain um, contact with the abutters as we go through this. So, uh, Tom, are you frozen or no? You're not. Okay, you're moving. Sorry. Do, do you want to <laughs> do you want to call the vote? <laughs> right. I just dozed off there. Uh, yeah, you did. <laughs> Councillor Clucci. Yes. Councillor Hayes. Councillor Hayes. Oh yes, sorry. Yep. Councillor Gleistein. No. Councillor Katarina? Yes. Uh, Councillor Hamill? Yes. Count, uh, Chairman Johnson? My vote doesn't count. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Councillor Johnson? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. 
I'll do better next time. Okay, order number 20086 is an act on names to various committees and boards as recommended by the appointments and negotiations committee at the September 16th, 2020 meeting. Um, so Don, I'll let you tee this up. Yeah, and I just wanna make a process suggestion. If uh, my uh, speech is not coming through clearly, I'd be happy to defer to one of my uh, council uh, committee counterparts to read through that so is are you getting this okay or not so you, far? yeah you sound fine and i don't have the list in front of me so okay. so we'll press on here so these are uh, folks for whom terms had expired in 2019 and we fell behind the curve uh due to covid and a, a variety of other things so so we're really uh, most of these people agreed to to renew uh, for the remainder of their terms, and we appreciate their continuing service and 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 pressing forward in an, in an uninterrupted way. So these reappointments are as follows: Community Services and Recreation Advisory Board reappointing Roger Chabot, Art Dillon, and Liam Somers to terms to expire 2022. Conservation Commission reappointing Peter Slavinsky and Charles Spanger to terms expiring 2022. Historic Preservation, reappointing Becky Delaware and Will Rowan, terms to expire 2022. And for the rest of these, all of these terms are expiring in 2022. Housing Alliance, reappointing Brian Shumway and appointing William Donovan. Parks and Conservation Lion Board, reappointing Susan Suzanne Foley Ferguson and Douglas Williams. Personnel Appeals Board reappointing Art Dillon and Penny Whitney as Doran. Senior Advisory Board reappointing Philip Christie, Jane Palmer, and Carol Raincourt. Sustainability Committee reappointing Deb McDonough. And finally, Transportation Committee reappointing Roger Beely and Carol Raincourt. And we uh, look forward to the Council's uh, uh, approval of these recommendations for reappointments. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? I just want, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. You got it, go ahead. Yep. Um, I just wanted to thank all of these people for stepping forward and serving on these boards and commissions. And I would remind folks out there that we're always taking applications. Um, even if there aren't openings yet, we hold on to the applications and look at them. And there are a number of uh, vacancies, particularly for alternate positions. So uh, just check in with Tody. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Okay, Tom? Councilor Clucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we are on to new business. It's order number 20087. It's a first reading and referred to the planning board, the proposed amendments to chapter 405 Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, section uh, 18B, Highest Parkway District. And Tom, do you wanna tell us what this is about? Uh, we do have Jay present. I, I would uh, prefer having him introduced, please. Okay, Jay, would you like to tell us? Uh, sure. This is actually a property owner um, initi initi uh, initiative, um, so I'm not sure if you are, want to bring them in to uh, present, but I can give you an overview. Um, so what, what's being sought is to include the ability to have drive-through restaurants in the Highest Parkway Zoning District. Um, this is a conversation um, that the uh, development team came to staff and and you know, had a, had a concept of what they wanted to do with their property. And we identified that the use wasn't allowed. And, um, but our, our ordinance does provide sort of two pathways forward for property owners to bring forward concepts. One is either through a contract zone or the other is through a zoning amendment. Um, and actually this is one that through the zoning amendment process, you know, staff's looking at sort of what the Highgast Parkway is suggested that if they are gonna propose for drive-throughs, that it be part of a multi-use building, which is what this uh, um, developer was proposing anyway, um, which would help to sort of minimize the 
uh, as folks have called it, sort of hamburger alley type uh, approach that you might see in Saco where you have a, sort of a number of individual franchises um, more like more likely than not, if you see these as part of a, a, a multi-use building, you're less likely to see sort of that proliferation. Um, not impossible, but less likely anyway. Um, so uh, that's what the property owner has proposed. And we did go to long range planning. There was a decent discussion there. I believe you have the minutes from that, um, as well as what came out of that long range planning committee meeting actually was, um, some questions, comments, concerns, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll uh, characterize it as regarding traffic. And they did ask to have um, the town's peer review traffic engineer provide sort of a high level analysis of what this might mean in terms of traffic. Um, and so I believe you have that report in your packet as well. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And again, um, turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um... By some nodding, should, would anybody want to hear from the property owner? Does anybody? No. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would. All right. Sure. Property owner, there are three people in attendance. I wonder, Andrew, uh, Richard, or Dan, would one of you raise your hand to maybe speak on behalf of the group? Andrew, Dan, or uh, Richard? There's Andrew. Okay, Andrew, you're in the meeting, so you just need to unmute your mic. Yes, can you hear me? We can, yep. Um, I actually put on Facebook this week, one of the most common phrases through this COVID issue is, can you hear me? <laughs> and the second most is, you're on mute. That's As we get used to the uh, <laughs> this process. I, I do it a lot in my profession. I, I run an engineering business. It's called Hoyle Tanner, and we represent the owners. Two of the owners are here on here here also. Uh, we specialize in, in mostly civil engineering. Um, but uh, they asked us, when we looked at this site, we looked at the zoning ordinance, we had some ideas on what might work. The site is adjacent to the uh, golf and ski shop, which is on the corner of Payne Road and Hagus. Our parcel is the parcel that's next to the bike and ski, uh, the golf and ski shop on Hagus. We're actually going to use an existing entrance as our entrance into the into the facility. And he just brought up the concept that we've been starting to work with. This concept has not gone to site plan approval yet. Main reason is we don't we feel that we need this zoning amendment before we can go forward. Um, this concept actually shows two drive-throughs: one that would be a bank and one that would be a, a, a restaurant. And uh, the idea is that we'll have a, a single story building with, with retail. There might be uh, office space on the second story. So it certainly won't look anything like a standalone restaurant facility. Um, when we found out about that we'd need this zoning change, um, we worked with Jay and, and eventually went to the long range planning committee. But, we feel that uh, with this one sentence amendment, it will solve um, our problem with moving forward, but it also will leave a good tool for the, for the town to use in any future development. Again, traffic was an issue at the long range planning committee meeting, but uh, we are currently doing traffic studies on our own for this project, but the town did um, solicit a third party engineer. He wrote the letter, his letter agrees with our our uh, <clears throat> assumption is that these roads are, are uh, designed and used for heavy traffic volumes right now, but should those volumes exceed themselves sometime in the, in the future, we um, will always be able to engineer around those or subsequent applications will have to look at solutions. But right now they're, they're, they're uh, designed fairly well and that, that's shown in that conclusion on the letter in front of you. Uh, again, Richard McGoldrick and Dan Catlin, the owners are here too, if you'd have specific questions for them. Um, but I think uh, Jay kind of summarized everything I was going to say. So that's, that's what I can add, add to and certainly would uh, welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, any 
I still have to do public comment, but before I do, any questions from us for Andrew or Jay? Councillor Hayes? Yeah, just a quick question for Jay. I'm not sure I, I understood it. So, it, Jay, as you gave your, your introduction, if we are we approving this this zoning change for just this location, or is it all up and down the Hagus Parkway? Nope, it would be. It's the Hagus Parkway district in total. It's not just this property. Um, you know, there's really only, there's two ways in town that you can adjust zoning. It's either district wide or by contract zone, and contract zone then would be specific to a property. So this is a, so even though this particular proposal looks pretty benign because it's set back from the road and there's tree cover, that doesn't necessarily preclude your description of Hamburger Alley then, right? Well, I think one of the things that was talked about with the long range planning committee and what's proposed here is that the, the use needs to be part of a plan development review, which is a heightened review process by the planning board. It really goes through what we call a master, well, the process is actually called the plan development process and there's really a three-step process to it. Um, so it, it requires a site inventory analysis. So you first look at sort of the site characteristics of a property, both the built environment and or the natural environment um, and to sort of determine where the best sort of most viable buildable areas of a lot are. Then it goes through a plan development process and there's a, a, a series of additional standards that are applied to a plan develop to the master plan process within the Highest Parkway zone that talk about screening and buffering and those sorts of things. Um, and then ultimately it would go before a site plan review. So there's sort of these three steps of, of process, um, but you're correct, I mean, this is, Oh, I guess the other piece that we talked about is, I guess why I talked about sort of the, the, the hamburger alley, if you will, what this requires is that it also be part of a mixed use building. So typically, you know, it, it can't be, a, it won't be a standalone um, drive through restaurant. It's gonna be part of a building that has other uses in it. They may not look like this and that you're right. It doesn't preclude that each lot may not go ahead and propose something like this. So I, I don't mean to uh, um, say that that's not a possible outcome. Um, it just seems like a less probable outcome, if you will. And Jay, just one follow-up question. When you said there was a lot of concern about traffic and it looks like there's two ways in, they come in off, I guess, or they come in, coming off pain, but did it also, that it sounded like it looked at it as a static state of just this. Did it even anticipate if the WEX building's going in with 1,200 people, possibly 2,400 employees, the auto dealership across the street, did it look ahead to what the future traffic flows might be and what that, what might be the implications? Yeah, and so again, I, I, I just want to reiterate what the, the long range planning committee really asked to look at was at the, the big picture, not at this particular proposal, because that's what a site plan application would do. As part of a site plan application, this project needs to look at projects that are both built and even projects that have been approved ahead that may not be built yet. So that's traffic in the uh, Downs development, for example, I think some of what you're talking about, um, Councillor Hayes, that is approved but not yet built. That's all part of any site plan application that comes forward. So what the long range planning committee asked was less specific to this particular application, recognizing that the planning board will take a look at those uh, very sort of specific details, was really a, a, a um, I'll say a 30,000 foot view um, to have a traffic engineer look at it generally. Because in the Highest Parkway currently, there's a number of non-residential uses um, and even some mixed residential uses that are allowed. So it's really what, what are those impacts? And so again, that's captured in that letter from the traffic engineer um, that's the town's third party peer review engineer. Um, so um, we like to think a sort of independent voice on, on the matter. Um, so hopefully you've had an opportunity to take a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Councilor Johnson? Jay. 
JJ. Jake, were, were you around when we did the Hankus Parkway? Uh, yeah. Nope. I believe that I've been working for town for 13 years. Hankus Parkway was in before I came to town. It was in. Because I remember Hankus Parkway. Uh, and I know there was an awful lot of time, money, and energy put in it. And, you know, it, it clearly states that this is a non permitted use. You know, it, it's restaurants with no drive up no drive through and no drive in service. So there was, there was a rationale behind it. I'm really don't want to editorialize, but I'm really starting to think maybe we need to revisit all our zoning because we just get stacked up with zoning changes all the time. Zoning serves a purpose in this town. And, uh, I, I think there's going to be a compelling reason to, uh, to change it. So this is not just a textual change. This is a permitted use change, correct? That is the request, correct. Okay. I, I, I will say, Councillor Johnson, to your fundamental question, uh, during my time here, the Hikus Parkway zone has been significantly modified, uh, liberalized um, from the original HP zone. Uh, and that was really in recognition and not in response to a particular request, but in recognition that the land sat stagnant for a decade or better. Uh, that the original vision of corporate office parks uh, was simply not going to happen. And it, it may have a lot to do with the fact that uh, early on we approved a major retail use uh, in the Cabela's complex, which uh, you know immediately out of the gate uh, kind of set it in a different direction. So uh, the record's very clear, at least my recollection is, that the Hygus Parkway zone has been significantly modified and liberalized, uh, recognizing that uh, the market uh, is different. Yeah, correct, and to your point, again, I'm not gonna beleaguer it, but you know, uh, growth management is not only you know, residential, it is commercial. And I think we're really making poor choices in changing our management policies by market demand. That's not way to manage growth. That's the way to promote growth. And at that, I'll end my comment. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Uh, Councilor Hamill and then Councilor Caterina. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. I think these are, these are probably also for Jay and possibly for Tom. Hey, but hey, I, Don, do you I'm want looking at this map and it, it Sorry, I was just going to say we should probably put this on the floor if we're going to, if we're going to debate it. That's all. I was just going to procedurally, I don't think we moved it. So do you want to move it so we can debate it? Uh, yeah, I move that we uh, put this to to a vote. Yep. And do we have a second? Second. Okay, now go ahead, Councilor Hamill. Go ahead. Yep. So for discussion, um, yeah, I, I'm looking at the map here, and uh, it does seem, I mean, some things that strike me, I hear what everyone's saying in terms of this being a permitted use change for the whole, you know, for the whole district, you know, for the, and that's, that is, you know, uh, a little concerning. I, I have to agree with that. However, I think it's Parkway has been a work in progress for a long time. We've tried many things to try to breathe life into it. And I know that's not alone a rational to change the zoning, but it looks like there's buffering here along Higgins Parkway for the for those losses. Is that true all along the way in terms of, are, are, is that buffering vegetation required? Uh, so Sorry. I'll, take, I'll take that question if, if the chair is, uh, if I'm allowed. Yes, please go ahead. Yep. yep. So the Hygus Parkway does, zoning district does have a buffering standards along the right of way edge, the front, um, the frontage, if you will, of all lots. They're to maintain a 25 foot vegetated buffer. Um, so I think, you know, there's, you can see, you know, certainly there's some clearing that needs to occur for driveways and such, but I think you can see um, for, you know, the, the climbing gym and the, um, and the fitness center are, are good examples of that, as well as the Horizon Solutions um, office building that's further down near Scotto Hill. Um, you can sort of, you can see the buildings, but there's a decent stand of vegetation between uh, the roadway. Um, in the building, so there is some, uh, there is that requirement. I believe it's a 25 foot 
um, buffering. Okay. And I also wanted to just uh, remind everybody that uh, this is uh, going to be required to be a mixed use with another building. So it's not like it's going to be a standalone, you know, drive through restaurant or Starbucks or whatever. So, you know, hopefully that's another mitigating factor uh, for us to consider. I will, I will uh, kind of uh, add to what Councillor Johnson said is that I thought that, you know, and Peter Hayes also, I think, referenced this. I thought that the opinion by the traffic person was, was uh, resoundingly uh, muffled. You know, it wasn't really clear to me uh, whether he was saying this was, you know, going to be able to pass muster over time from a traffic standpoint. So I still, that seems still to me to be an open question. Uh, thank, thank you, sir. You, sir. Councillor Katarina? Um, yeah, of course, I've been part of the long range planning uh, discussions on this. And I know one of my thoughts was, you know, instead of drive through, have it the takeout windows. So you, it's a, di a slightly different concept. It's pickup. That being said, I'd like to remind my fellow councillors that this is the first reading. Uh, and what we're doing is, you know, you've raised some good questions and whatever, but it does need to go to the planning board which gives us a little bit more time to get some feedback from them as to what their thoughts are on this, to solidify our own thinking on what we think before it comes back for a second reading. So I just wanted to remind folks of that. This isn't the end all be all tonight. Uh, and I would support, I have questions, but I would certainly support sending this forward to the planning board. Any others? Uh, Councilor Gleisen, do you want to say, I, I, you don't have a camera, so I'm just asking. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I, I share these concerns. I, I feel like we take all the right steps. We go through the right committees. You know, we get the traffic study. Um, but, you know, you're talking about dr drive through traffic that's going to come in and out of Payne Road and in and out of Hygis um, and kind of change what um, Hygis is now, you know, to Tom's point. It, it has been changed, but, um, you know, and I I tonight I don't have any uh, brilliant ideas about what more we need to do to better um, understand this but I do agree with um, some of my fellow counselors that this is a you know this is a fairly large um, change for the entire um, zone and uh, it's not just a contract zone that's that's being requested and I know I don't feel like we have what we need right now to make uh, a, a solid choice on this. And of course it is just first read, but um, I think we need to put some time and energy into thinking about what else we need besides, you know, it going to the planning board. That's, that's always helpful. Um, but a lot of times the planning board doesn't even have exactly, you know, what they need. I, I, th I think the comments from long range planning, you know, were quite helpful to me to hear that, to read those, <laughs> especially um, some of the comments made by, um, uh, I'm trying to think who it is right now. I, I'm blanking. I'm so sorry. The liaison between the planning board and long range. Um, her comments were quite helpful. So, you know, I need to do a little more homework on this myself. Um, but I do think it's, you know, I, I, I don't think it should be, you know, a, a no brainer shoe in. I think, I think there's more that we need to understand about it. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, Councilor Clucci and then Andrew, I'll let you respond to some comments because I know your hand raised. So. Yeah, I, I mean, this is a, a, it's a tricky one in that we're looking at a specific project that I think it, to me looks like it makes a lot of sense for the area, you know, putting a coffee shop and part of a mixed use development next to a huge apartment complex nestled behind a retail. Uh, so I, I think this project makes a lot of sense, but we need to be kind of cautious, you know, to Jay's point about Hamburger Alley, uh, that we want to, you know, make sure that whatever else might happen through the zoning change also makes <laughs> sense in the area. I think that's just, I guess, what I'd be looking for uh, from the planning board to see. I, I think there are some clauses that you put in here, like it has to be part of a planned development, has to be part of a mixed use development that probably add the right protections. Um, but I'd be interested if there are others that can make it a little more specific. Um, but I, do, I support sending this to the planning board. I think it's a good project for the town. Uh, I think as we change zoning, we have to make sure that we're thinking about everything that this could impact and not just a specific, specific project. Andrew, did you want to respond to? Yeah, it's it's a it's a little confusing because 
for us to go to the planning board, we have to be in the correct zone. We're not in the correct zone right now. So, I mean, we've been very gently um, designing or, or taking baby steps with this project. Some of the fear that I always have is showing the concept that we don't know if that's going to end up being the concept or not when it eventually goes through in a zoning amendment process. I, I guess it's hard to, to really look at detail at this, this facility and say, and start commenting on it like it's a planning board review because we can't, we can't go there without the, without the zoning amendment. Um, today's trend is quick service restaurants. Uh, that's why you, you're gonna get a lot of that pressure from here or not because of, of what we're going through now. And we're just looking at what is the least intrusive type of, of drive-through, or maybe it's a, a takeout, a pickup type thing, or maybe it's a combination. We'll look at those different different uh, options, and certainly a client that wants to, uh, to, to take part of this building is going to have their own ideas too, and we may be coming back before the planning board, maybe even before the, before the council for a different amendment, but um, these are steps that we have to take through. This is the first step. If, if we can't um, get this, this amendment, and by no means do I mean it's a minor amendment, we just feel it's a good amendment. We've run it up the pole a little bit in the town through planning and long range, and now we're at the stage with the council. Um, we feel that it's, it's uh, the right direction. I think Jay does too. And, uh, you know, we'd like to have your support, but um, keep in mind that a lot of these, these questions that you have are going to be answered at the planning board stage. We have to do a massive traffic study for this thing and, and address those issues for safety, volume. You're not going to be able to back cars from a, from a queuing situation out into Hagus Parkway. That's a long ways. If you back that out, that would be, you know, 30 plus cars probably before you'd get out that far. But you've got to look at those different um, questions when you go through the site plan process with the DOT permit to the traffic permit to get through this. So there's a, many, many stages, but we can't, we can't go a lot further without being in the correct zone. So that's why we're here tonight. And, you know, if we can answer any questions again, Richard and Dan are on, on the line too. I don't know if they'd like to pipe in, but um, this is where we are in the process as most developers are in a process like this. And again, I thank you for, getting to this point and being able to address you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, oh, Andrew, I kicked you out. I'm sorry, I can pull you back in if I have to. Um, I'm sorry, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, can I, I just, I'm, I'm a little confused at just a point of process and really trying to, to build on what Councillor Katarina put out. He, to me, I think there's a couple of major issues. One, they're talking about a whole sort of rezoning or drive to all up and down Hagus. That's sort of what's on the table tonight. It sounds like if we move this forward to the planning board, they're gonna look just at the site specific proposal. So it really, do they look at what it means all up and down Hagus Parkway? Yeah, the issue yeah. in front the, the issue in front of you is changing, adding this use to the zone. And so that's what the planning board will comment on. That's what Andrew was just referring to. Uh, they're not in a point of having site plan review, which would be the detailed review on what they're actually proposing. So it's this bit of a catch-22 they find themselves in. And I'll just remind you what Jay meant, uh, started with, which is the only two ways this can come forward. And, and re remember, this is not coming forward from staff. This is initiated by the property owner, is either by way of contract zone, which I think there is generally some distaste for that approach, which would be site specific and give you arguably protections uh, with that, but I think it has some other challenges, or to do a zoning amendment as is being proposed that would have the effect of allowing this use uh, in the entire zone. Okay. So I'm, I'm not taking the last word here, Don, I'm just adding to the conversation. Um, so I have two thoughts is a, I actually, frankly, think this should be a contract zone. Um, I think it'd be an easier decision with a contract zone. I know that's an ugly C word, so to speak with, with us, but this is a contract zone that makes sense. I'm actually a little concerned of doing some crowding out of the downs. If all of a sudden we turn the Haigas Parkway into this mix, mixed use Mecca, then all of a sudden we have these two competing developments that are right next to each other that are essentially trying to do the same thing. And I, I don't know, I don't think 
that is smart on our end. I don't think we could fill both places, so to speak. And I, I so I feel like mixed use wise, we know we know that's coming in the downs. Why, you know, I think we really need to have a conversation of why would we, why are we trying to encourage the exact same time, exact same type of development right next to the downs? So, I mean, my instinct here is, I mean, and again, I'm not taking the last word. I'm just having the conversation is I would be more inclined to um, support this and support it quicker, so to speak, if it was specific to a site, not the entire Haggis Parkway. Uh, Councilor Hamill. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think we have not really framed or addressed uh, the broader question. Uh, and you offer a, a process to do that. It does seem a little curious to me that we would have, you know, a single property owner trying to make this zoning change that would benefit the entire district. So I, you know, so uh, I agree with the conversation as it's evolved and the suggestion. Yeah, I just want to be clear there, you know, it doesn't serve their purpose beyond the lot that they own and they're interested in. It's just a function of how to accomplish what they're asking. Uh, there's really two, two approaches. Yeah, no, I agree. I, yeah, I, I think it, as an end, as a means to their end, I think, I just feel like a contract zone might, might be an easier discussion. Hmm. Councilor Johnson. Well, isn't the premise of the contract zone is that you cannot do your, your business without exceptions for that zoning. And that's not the case. I heard, you know, I thank the applicant to come up and explain uh, the detail that he did, but it was very obvious that they're not even sure what's going in there yet. He, well, they would have, they'd have to give us exactly what's going in there and then we would grant them the exception. So for example, I think a drive through coffee store fits perfectly right there on that side of Haigas Parkway sandwiched between a, a hot, very high end apartment complex and the main turnpike. But I don't know if I, it makes sense for, in my mind, to grant drive through restaurants for that whole two and a half mile stretch. I mean, so that's, so, so that's where, I guess that's where I, so if I were the developer, I just feel they, they're, they're left with two decisions. They either need to change the rules or ask an exception and they've decided to try to change the rules. And I'm just saying as a counselor, I'd be more inclined to grant them an exception. That's all I'm saying. And it would be, it, it'd be against the, it would be against the current zoning and we'd give them an exception. Yep. Okay. So just to follow up. So I understand. So let's say we go with the exception. Yep. So then when couple and farms come, how do we not give them the exception? We tell them that we, that's the whole point. It's the same reason why we didn't, there's not a million retirement communities on route 77. Piper Shores has that. And we, if anybody else wanted to get. What's that? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, no, it's a, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, it's, that's, I mean, that's what we've done with uh, car dealerships. We've decided, we've essentially said, okay, fine. You can, right. you just have to come to us individually. <laughs> no, no, I might just offer as part of that. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll defer to. Okay. Yeah. Hold on, Jay. Let, let yep. Councilor Johnson finish his thoughts. Yeah, then. That's one of the functions of zoning. So we don't have to have these discussions and these decisions. You know, it's, it's, it's the type of development where you want the development. It's the framework of the development. Yeah, I agree. I do. Anyway. Yeah. Counselor, uh, not counselor. Jay, are you a counselor yet? I don't know. <laughs> Jay, did you want to respond? <laughs> uh, no, I, I just wanted to offer, I, I, I there was the, I, I think I heard the question about sort of, um, you know, if it, um, what what sort of parameters are in the in the zoning for for making the decision around a contract zone? And I just wanted to just identify that through that contract zone process, there are sort of explicit processes by which the board is to determine if if a project ha meets a certain public benefit. Um, so the contract. So again, I think as Tom's already said, and I don't mean to sort of belabor that, but um, you know, th there are really only two. The, the zoning ordinance allows for any property owner to initiate a, con a, a, a zone change in two ways. Um, the other way that zone changes can be initiated are through staff or through council, um, and that's a separate process. But um, so, I think. You know, to, to the question um, as to what stops people from coming forward, well, really nothing, um, because they, it's written right in the zoning ordinance that they have that right as property owners to come forward and the pathways are spelled out for them. And as staff, we do our best to try to provide what information we can. I know I consulted with Tom on this one before, you know, trying to, you know, sort of 
give a give a pathway forward. Um, but I, you know, I hope you recognize that as staff, I get asked these questions many times throughout the week. Um, many projects come forward that don't meet zoning, and I say, well, you're not meeting the zoning. And the next question is, well, what can I do? And I have to tell them, well, the zoning has these processes that are available to you. Um, so um, that's part of part of the work that we do, um, if not daily, at least weekly in our department. Thanks, Jay. That was help. That thank you for that's helpful to us. Yeah. So, um, Paul, um, this is Betsy. If you can hear me, um, I'm hoping I'm not jumping in front of anyone, um, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, my big concern is, you know, the, you know, the unintended consequences, um, because, you know, we make a zone change, and then if we don't have enough protections in it, so these are transient um, trips, for sure, right? If you're going to be driving through, your whole purpose is to go somewhere and drive through. You're not parking, you're not going into the bank to do business, um, you're not going into Foley's to work out, you're, you know, you're, you're transient, and, you know, I just, it kind of the way that plan looks is like you partly you can cut through a parking lot to another parking lot and again we're not talking about the specifics of the plan i i understand that but my concern is if we pass a if we pass a zoning change that we don't understand the full ramifications of it it might need more parameters under it to say yes you know you could have drive through or pick up but you can't have you know you can't use one parking lot to access another parking lot you know so you know I don't, I, I don't pretend I'm smart enough to know what all those things are right now. Um, but, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I do want to think what, you know, Councillor Johnson says zoning is so we shouldn't have to do contract, um, you know, contract zones. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes they're, you know, they're helpful in, in a certain circumstance. So, you know, um, I guess we'll hear from the planning board on this. Um, I'm assuming they'll give it a lot of thought. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of discomfort right now with uh, changing the whole two and a half miles. Well, look, and I don't know if it's two and a half miles, so I apologize if I, I that was just my <laughs> okay. guess. <laughs> okay, the one mile, the one so and a half, understand. whatever, yeah. But, okay, Tom, can I play devil's advocate for one second here? Because to me, what's going to happen at the planning board is the planning board is going to say, well, it's not ultimately not our decision, it's the council's decision. So, here, so then here, because the planning board isn't going to quote kill this under any circumstances they're going to work it make suggestions and then pass the buck back to us as they should by the way so this is not a reflection on the planning board but i think the reason why we're all kind of struggling with this a little bit is i don't think we're under any we're, i think we've all at least been counselors long enough that the planning this isn't going to go away we will see this for second reading and it will be the same request right i mean what is the path that the planning board actually massages this request? They, they won't, correct? No, but they are a key resource to you and will offer uh, advice and guidance that you can consider and, and, uh, and include as part of your second and final reading if you wished. But you're right, no, they, they, they lack the authority. That's not their role to kill this. Yeah. Uh, it will in fact come back to you, but ideally it would come back with their input suggestions I just want to make the point that though staff did not bring this forward as, you know, our initiative, um, I think there is, uh, having said that, there is a level of comfort with the fact that there's planned development requirements, that there needs to be part of a mixed use, and the fact that uh, the particulars are really sorted through at site plan review by the planning board. And so there, I, I, I just want to make sure everyone appreciates that there are some safeguards, that it's not going to be the Wild West. Um, so I, I'm not sure which way you want to go on this. Um, I've heard interest expressed in the contract zone route. I think Joe, uh, Jay's points were very well taken. Uh, I don't know how you can craft a legitimate argument of public benefit with this, uh, no offense to the developers, but, uh, I think that would be a very difficult standard to expect that they could meet. I don't know. I think Betsy, although you said it was transient, I think we can agree. We could, we could use a coffee place on our side of town. There's some public benefit. <laughs> I know you're making light of it, but, but this issue has been really controversial in past contract zones. Um, and I'm just being honest. My assessment is that's a tough, tough argument to make with this project. Again, no, but we make, the the same, we make the same argument for car dealerships. What public benefit do they, what, I mean, we, we, we twist it for car dealerships to be able to get it. I mean, 
and it doesn't feel comfortable every time right. you do. But yeah, sure, right. Uh, okay, anybody else? Do we have any? Peter? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, just one consideration, we certainly have heard it from some of the other developers in town, but it, it sure sounds like the planning board's got a pretty, pretty full packet of projects that they're having problems getting through the pipeline as quickly as some developers would like, I think. Um, if we're uncomfortable, you know, I mean, it's just a consideration. We're sending something to the planning board that they're going to be spending some considerable time on. If, if we're not comfortable, you know, are we better off, you know, saying that tonight? I mean, it's just a consideration. I, for one, will not, I'm not going to support it tonight. I just think, I don't think we want Higgis Parkway to become Hamburger Alley. And I, I know we can have some considerations, but I agree with actually Councilor Ken Johnson, we have zoning in place for reasons, and this is sort of just opposed on what we just heard about the comprehensive plan about what we wanted to preserve and stay true to what we've designed. And I, I think, Chair Chairman Johnson, to get to your point, yeah, we are setting up a competing, you know, we're trying to get some of this activity into the downs. I just, I just think we're, we're letting a project in a need of a developer really, you know, maybe compromise what we try to achieve with our zoning and other things. So I'm not ready to open up Higgis Parkway to, to drive through alley. So I'm going to vote no. Yeah, and I think the only thing I'm struggling with is it's like, you know, Higgis Parkway is probably the most industrial commercial road in town, right? So it's, I don't know, it's in it and it's been a money suck for us. So I, I mean, that's just, it's, it's a, that that's my only struggle with with do I think that drive throughs made sense make sense there? Maybe one, but right. I don't know if I'm willing to do like Betsy or I have I don't know if it's two and a half miles, but I don't know. I don't know. So but you know, having said that though, you know, Scarborough Downs is bringing a lot of interest to that space. And you look at just the development that's gone in on Hagus in the last two years. That's true. Yep. They're attractive buildings and they fit in. And, and so you compare and contrast that to drive through and it, yes, it can be, you know, multi-use, but it could be a 7-Eleven next to a, you know, a McDonald's drive through which, you know, it's, you know, so I'm just not ready unless it's more fleshed out about what that whole Hagus Parkway might look like. I'm just not comfortable at this point. Yep. Okay. Uh, Councillor Kluge? Yeah, I support sending this to the planning board. I, I don't know if this is a question for Jay, or maybe I'll put it out there for the planning board to consider, but I don't think any of us wants to see Hagus Parkway lined with, you know, drive-through restaurants. And I, I think there are some protections in there, like Tom and Jay said, but you might consider another one, for example, like you can't have two similar uses within half a mile of each other or something. There, there may be additional protections that we could put in that would give, I think, us confidence that um, yeah, this fits here, but it's not, you're not going to see it, you know, very on the rest of the Hagus Parkway or, or, or maybe down at the other end. Um, so I don't know, Jay, if you have any thoughts on. Yeah, I actually, I was just thinking, and, and so thank you for the segue. Um, there, we do have examples in some other zones where we've sort of said, okay, this type of use may be allowed in this zone, but it's only allowed in this zone within a certain distance of a certain intersection, for example. Or so actually, I'll just use the, we're all thinking of it, the downs, right? The innovation district. The innovation district is only allowed to be in a certain area um, of the downs property. It can't be across the whole downs property. And then even within that, I believe it's uh, in, uh, forgive me, I'm shooting from the hip. I don't, I didn't pull up the zoning, but I believe it's gas stations or something to that ilk are only allowed to be within or can't be any further than I should say, I'm just again from the hip, let's say 1200 feet from the intersection of Downs Road and Payne Road, something to that effect. So um, that may be one way of sort of getting at the issue. It, you know, um, not to say that's the right, the answer, but um, to your point, that would be one way of potentially thinking about it. But then, you know, I guess just to put it on the table as the planner, I think, well, then are you really ostensibly thinking about a contract zone? And is that, you know, and 
and, and there's really, again, I don't, there's not one answer. There's not one right answer to this. Uh, um, so I just sort of lay, lay all that out before you as you think about it. So um, can I ask a procedural question, Paul? Yep, go ahead. I mean, is there a reason we can't table this and also still vote to send it to have the planning board take a look at it? I mean, I think none of, it doesn't sound like a number of councils are, are comfortable with, with the way it is. And yeah, we, we can push it through and then, but then we all know we're in between first and second reading and that can be a heavy lift to get things changed um, and a little bit of a messy process. So um, is that procedurally possible that we table it and we also still say, you know, we want, we want Jay to work on this um, and kind of work with the planning board some and then bring it back to us? Well, I think it comes back to what are we expecting from the planning board, right? I mean, I don't know. But, well, let's answer the question. I'm sorry, Betsy. So what's the procedurally? I'm proposing to table it. Okay. Well, then conversation is over, correct? Well, it needs to be a seconded, right? So. Second. Table it to a date certain. Betsy, do you have a date? Uh, next meeting. Okay. And a second from Councilor Johnson, I believe. Was that right? Second. Okay, so we're voting to table. Uh, Tom? Yes. Councilor Clucci? No. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Caterina? No. Councillor Johnson? Yes. Councillor Hamill? No. Chairman Johnson? No. The, uh, the no's carry, so the matter's still active before the council. Councillor Hayes? Yeah, just building on Betsy's process and actually building on uh, John's question. So if we want at what point in the process, if, if as Jay had suggested, if we wanted to put in restrictions, they can't be within a half mile or things like that. Where does that occur? Does that occur with recommendations from the planning board or do we need to do that before we pass it to the planning board? I can help answer some of that or Tom, if you want to. Yeah, I, I, Peter, you could certainly add those provisions in tonight by amendment. Uh, they could also come through by way of planning board input. Uh, but in any event, the council could certainly introduce amendments at second reading uh, to improve the product. Uh, the only question there would be, and, and I don't think it would matter in this case, whether those changes are substantive such that it would require it to go back to first reading. But um, I, we can deal with that if and when it is an issue. So, I mean, for instance, I mean, Peter or, uh, or John, I mean, anybody can offer an amendment right now to add in the one mile apart to maybe just at least set a benchmark for them to work with, right? Is that, I mean, I mean, I don't want to suggest for, I'm not, I don't want to just willy nilly say a mile apart, but if it just, if it gets us to a place where, where at least we're signaling to the planning board pretty clearly that we don't really love this and we don't want it to be hamburger alley, that might be a way to pass it through and signal that pretty clearly. If I may, just 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 on just on that thought, and and I'm not an attorney, but so I I would want to tease this through. I I I don't believe that you can sort of zone by saying certain uses, if they're allowed in a zone, need to be a certain distance apart. But what I do think you can do, getting at sort of the same sort of issue, quite frankly, but just a different way of cutting it <laughs> is to say they can be within a certain distance of a location if that makes sense um so but i'm i'm happy to ask that question um chairman johnson i just i don't want to sort of set a you know put forth an amendment that may be something that we have to then tweak um, oh, that makes that makes absolutely perfect sense we can't limit I, them I, but yeah that but we could say they have to be within a thousand foot of a major intersection you could do that, and the town has done that. Okay, all right, Council Hamill. Yeah, I I think I, I'm I'm feeling as though we're on the the, the verge of practicing without a license here a little bit, <laughs> even though that we're trying to do too much without 
without the right skills and accreditation. So I'd rather that we let this thing go one way or another further in the process and you know, then decide when we feel we're more confident and educated to do oh, so. Isn't that what we, I thought this whole thing was practicing without a license. Isn't that what we're elected to do? <laughs> uh, Councilor Kruzzi? Well, to that point, I'm, I'm hoping that they, it's our secret. <laughs> we'll be able to take our comments as it, you know, wild, you know, as dis differing as they are, but then try to make sense of them, sit down with the planning board and see if they can come back with something that we'll be comfortable with. And, and if they can't, then we'll either drop it or try to amend it ad hoc on our own. But I'd rather not do that at this point in the process because uh, there's a lot of things to consider. And I, I, we're, we're not the best people to necessarily be doing that on the fly. Andrew, I'm just, Andrew, I, just because we're in the debating stage, I, I, I'm just going to ask you to keep it brief just because I think we need to move on here, but I will just, if you have something quick. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think back. It was quite a while ago. I think when we were talking about whether it was a, a contract zone change or a, a amendment to the whole zone, um, to us, it really doesn't make a difference. It's it's you that is going to look down the road and it's, and it's your responsibility. But I think those um, the amendments in the planning department and the planning board um, look at these issues and put things in there that will give limitations to, I, I don't think you're going to see a, you know, hamburger alley on, on Hagas Parkway. I don't think you could anyway, whether this amendment goes through or not, because multi-use buildings are going to, it means multi-use. It doesn't mean the same use. You, you can't have you know, one right next to the other part of a building. We could do a contract zone change. We, if you guys think that's the better way to go, I personally don't. I think you're going down the right road with a limitation of distance. But I, you know, I think the planning board might have some comments that would be constructive for you guys to take into account at the next meeting. All right, thanks, Andrew. I'm going to disable your talk now. And for, for what it's worth, uh, you know, Jay and I have certainly heard your conversation. I think uh, Jay and his staff can certainly be. Um, can prompt the planning board in a number of these areas, and perhaps we can have some thoughts prepared uh, for their consideration. Okay, I think I'm going to call the vote. I think everybody seems to. Tom, take your time on this one, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Clucci. Yes. Councilor Hayes. No. Councilor Gleistein. No. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? No. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. The ayes carry, uh, passed in first reading. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Andrew and uh, the other two uh, owners. Okay, with that, we are headed on. Is everybody, does everybody, do we want a break or is everybody doing okay? Keep going, power through it. Okay, all right, order number 20088 is first reading and refer to the planning board, the proposed amendment to the zoning map relating to the rezoning of Muzzy Road. And I'm going to... Imagine that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm trying to pull up the map, I apologize. Uh, Jay, would you like to this up for us? Uh, sure. Um, this is a, another property owner uh, initiated request. This request is a little different than what we just went through. This is a request to change the zoning of a particular parcel. So not to change the language or the allowances or anything to do with the zones, but to change the zoning designation of the parcel. So I'm seeing on my screen a map here that shows 103 Muzzy Road in the middle of the, of the uh, page. 103 Muzzy Road is currently in the B3 zoning. The property owner would like to request council's consideration to modify this to an industrial zone. And they provided a letter uh, to that um, uh, in accordance with the zoning ordinance um, uh, provisions that enable uh, these requests to be made by the property owners. 
and I believe uh, it's, um, uh, Steve Bushy may be on the call. I can't see as an attendee, but um, who, you know, the council so inclined is representing the owner on this project. I'm going to pull Steve in. I think that's easiest right now. Steve, you are in if you want to unmute yourself. Good evening, sir. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, so I'm representing Transport Leasing, uh, who have owned the property at uh, 103 Muzzy for quite a period of time. And this goes back when the property was previously zoned industrial. And then I think around the 2009 time frame, uh, it was changed to the B3. You'll note here on the figure that uh, there is an industrial zone uh, just nearby uh, on the opposite side of Nielsen Road headed towards uh, the South Portland side of town. So the uh, transport leasing folks also own property on Pleasant Hill Road. Um, ultimately their, their uh, main business uh, program is in the industrial side rather than retail or otherwise. Uh, that's their forte. They run EPCO uh, uh, storage as one of their business lines. And they have uh, the opportunity to construct a building on the property with, uh, they actually have a couple of prospects right now uh, that are more industrial oriented uh, in terms of their use, including uh, recycling business and or strictly warehousing. Uh, in the marketplace right now, warehousing is certainly uh, a, a big uh, uh, opportunity for uh, landowners because there's a shortage of uh, space here in the, the uh, local market. So they are looking to uh, get this property rezoned back to the industrial zone to allow them to move ahead with the construction of a building that is in uh, more in line with the land uses under the industrial zone. And uh, going back to that time frame when it was rezoned from industrial uh, to the B3, uh, they had uh, made comments to planning staff and, and the, the town in general about the need that at some point in the future, they, they may want to come back to revisit the industrial zone. We're given reasonable assurances that uh, hopefully the process would be smooth. And here we are uh, a number of years later, uh, simply doing that. So uh, that's what we're, we're here for. We hope it's relatively straightforward and look forward to your review and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for either Jay or Stephen before? Councilor Johnson? Jay, could you, could you just explain the difference of allowable uses from a B3 to an industrial? Uh, yeah, sure, in general, and I can, we, I mean, we can certainly go, generally, yeah. I'll start there. The, uh, the, the industrial district is this just that, it's an industrial district. And I think we all have a good picture in our mind of what that may mean from warehousing and manufacturing, contractor yards and those sorts of things. The B3 is more of a regional business center. And there I would start, I would think more in the lines of office buildings, uh, retail, um, um, daycares, restaurants, more service um, uh, um, uh, focused, I guess I'd say. Okay. So hopefully that helps. It, it does, but the adjacent property is uh, VR2, right? Uh, one of the adjacent properties appears to be, yes, I noticed that. Yep. Okay. Now, I, now the zoning change, I, I'm good. Let's put it on the floor before, and we'll discuss it, I believe. So is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, discussion. Councilor Katarina? Yeah, again, I was involved with this with long range planning. My one concern with long range planning was the creep of the, of the zone. Uh, there's a road there. Actually, it's a driveway that goes back to the original owner of the properties. Uh, um, house that apparently they still own that house back there the nielsen I, whoever it is doesn't matter um and so it's like moving the industrial zone over again and where is it going to stop and that was my only concern with this for those of you who are familiar with muzzy road this is when you're driving down there <clears throat> there's a bunch of containers 
just it looks like heck is what I had said in long range planning uh, right now. But um, I don't know, I have, I have mixed feelings again about the potential for creep of the zoning line, but the long range planning committee as a whole didn't, so. Stephen, can I ask you a question? Sure. So you guys, this property was owned by the current owner when it was zoned from industrial to B2, correct? Correct. And was that your initiative or was that town initiative? That was a town initiative and I'll rely on Jay or uh, Tom maybe to reinforce that. Uh, I personally wasn't involved with it back at that time, but I, I'm fairly certain that was a town initiative and maybe it was an outcome of the, uh, the gallery and things that were happening uh, in that area for and, the TL side. And I apologize, I'm, I'm being direct and short here because I'm getting, it's getting late. But, yep. and at the time, the owner, the pro current property, property owner had no issue with it getting switched because it didn't cramp the style of what you guys were doing. Is that correct? Right. Okay. And so you are looking to change the focus of your current business? Well, uh, ABCO uh, or transport leasing is now got the opportunity to uh, have at least one or more different tenants to occupy a building that would be more on the industrial side in terms of the land use. And it was a recycling center, okay, a uh, warehouse. And is this a dis is this distribution or is this more is this a, is the current plans a recycling center? And is there others or uh, no? Just a uh, small recycling center for uh, aluminum cans and uh, a warehouse. Okay, and Tom, do you know, do you remember the rationale between changing this from industrial to B2 t 10 years ago or what have you? I don't, uh, frankly, my recollection, and Steve, I, I, I beg your pardon, is that it was uh, property owner initiated, um, but I, we can verify that. I, I just don't recall exactly. Yeah, actually, Tom, I can just highlight, it was actually a town in initiative for the whole eight corners area. Um, it is sort of interesting to look at the, um, the 2006 comprehensive plan actually does call for this property to remain in the industrial um, zoning district. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely certain what went into the deliberation. I do have you know um, the, the notebook here from when, when it went through and what the consideration was by um, staff, the um, committee and council at the time, but so just For what it's worth, it was a town initiated process. Sorry, sorry, Jay. When the current owner bought this land, this, if we, it was a permitted use, what they want to do was a permitted use. That is correct. That is my understanding. Yes. Okay. So we took a private owner, we changed the zoning on them, right? And now the private owner wants the zoning back to back when they originally built the property. And so, Paul, I thought we had something in our packet that did say they expressed a concern at the time at 2009 yeah. when it was switched and they were told by the town, oh, well, you know, once you, you, you want it back, that's no problem. So I don't know why anybody yeah. would say that, but yeah, um, yeah so yeah. yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. I'm just trying, I feel like this is a case of somebody that's held onto a property for a extended period of time has, has weathered the zoning changing storm, so to speak, and, you know, board or something that's similar and wants to, it wants to take advantage of the zoning that was afforded to them when they bought the place. That's. Um, I had a question for Jay. So right now, um, as um, Councillor Katarina mentioned, um, the, you know, it's uh, containers and things like that. So, you know, the way you described the zone um, retail and things like that. Uh, so is it, is it meeting, you know, um, the, the current zoning requirements with the way that it's being used right now? Um, so there is, um, and it's been, I, I have to admit, it's been a few years since I've looked in the, the um, planning and code file for the property. Um, but as I recall it, there was at one point, and I can't tell you when it was, but more than 13 years ago, um, which is when I started in town, there was approval for use of that site for, gen for, for trailers, for generally what we see out there. I can't say if exactly what's happening now is perfectly aligned with that or not. Perhaps it, it is. Um, 
but there is something, and again, it's been a few years since I've looked in the, in the, in the file, because um, I know that question had come up in the past about sort of what was happening there. Um, so I think that hopefully answers part of the question anyway. <laughs> Any more thoughts, discussions, questions? Councilor Cucci? Just a quick, we, we've notified abutters of this pending change or potential change, right? And we haven't had any feedback yet? I'm not aware. So typically when it comes, when it comes to the planning board, certainly we'll do our notifications in our department. I'm not sure what happens when it's in for council first read that's without okay. So that might happen I'm next. Apologizing that I'm having to defer, but typically that's something the town clerk um, works through. And I'm not sure if that occurs at your first reading or if that occurs at subsequent um, action. But I know it happens before planning board public hearing. Okay. Tom, is that true? It, it, would hap it will happen when it gets to the planning board. I believe uh, the town clerk uh, satisfies the public notice by publication in the newspaper. I'm not aware that there's a an abutter not notification at this stage. Until it gets to the planning board. Okay. Any other thoughts, questions, comments, discussions? Okay, Tom, I think I'm calling the vote. Councilor Clucci. Yes. Councilor Hayes? No. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? No. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, order, no order number 2008, uh, excuse me, 20. 0089 is an act on the request to amend the emergency ordinance to relax standards for restaurants and retail use. Tom, you have 15 seconds. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, real simple pass at this. Uh, your emergency ordinance is due to expire uh, the 15th of October. And given the, the fact that we're still uh, in, in a different circumstance, we're proposing to extend that deadline to allow outdoor use of outdoor space to October, excuse me, um, April 15th, 2021. Thank you. Do I have a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. There's nobody left in the public, by the way, so I'm not taking public comment. Um, and there's any discussion? <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Johnson? <laughs> I definitely support this. This is not a zoning change. <laughs> not a zoning change. I'm just wondering, Tom, what, what are we doing? Because, you know, we do live in Maine, and it's going to get chilly. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming there'll be some type of heating mechanisms to support outdoor dining. What, what else have we put in place? Will that still be just part of, I mean, will we do a second round of property inspection? We'll have to. There's any number of codes that they need to be compliant with, not the least of which uh, the fire code. Yeah. And essentially, these will be indoor spaces. They'll have, uh, if, and I'm not sure if any establishment will actually use this, but I, I think the intent is that we'd like to make it available if someone yeah. wishes to find a way to make it happen. Uh, but you're right, there's any number of codes that they'll have to comply with. Right. Okay, thank you. If I, I'll just add that we do require for those that put up a tent, that's where some of this is happening and, and where you might see those heating any heating source is part of that tent permit process. And so, yes, we, we, there's only a handful, maybe, I don't even think we're at a dozen uh, sites that have actually come forward and got applications. So we are in constant communication with those folks and our commercial code and officer inspector will be on top of those type of issues, certainly. Um, but nothing else would need to happen from a zoning perspective, provided you move this forward. Any other comment? <laughs> Any other comments? Okay, Tom. Councilor Clucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. Uh, order number 2090 is act on the request to approve the charge for the Charter Review Committee. Um, 
this, I guess I'll introduce this, Betsy, or? Um, Would you like to so, introduce yep. Yeah, so this is, um, I, I think we talked about this you know, previously. It's, uh, it's uh, the charge for the charter. Um, you know, it wouldn't be 9.45 on a Wednesday night if um, I, I didn't uh, bring something forward, but I'll wait till discussion. Um, and uh, we're just putting together the committee. Hopefully everyone's had a chance to uh, read the charge and understand if there's anything that you think um, should be changed uh, with it. And, uh, you know, the timelines are aggressive, but we're hoping uh, to, to get this process moving. Thank you, Betsy. And I assume you want to move it forward. So moved. And a second. Second. Discussion. So I mentioned I was going to bring forward some discussion. I didn't mean to cut you off, Ken. I'm sorry. Um, I, I would like to have the town council um, consider uh, making the, making this, um, if, if not tonight, but for both this and the downtown committee, um, increasing the number of participants on this committee. Um, I, I didn't bring this up before because I really didn't think about it, but one of the ad hoc committees that we all constantly bring up is um, the committee, uh, the community center and how well that worked. And it occurred to me that one of the things that worked really well on that was the size of the committee, because especially for downtown, which we're not talking about right now, but for charter, that group was able to break into subcommittees and do um, some really targeted key work um, that seven people could have a, a uh, could have a problem doing. So my suggestion here is to is to see where you know what what you know to see how many applications that we get in for the two committees and then prior to um, voting for the actual uh, members on the committee that we do consider uh, potentially expanding um, both this committee and the downtown committee so i'm not asking for any action tonight i just want to put it out there um, other than that i think this is a great charge and i'm very excited to move this forward thanks Betty. uh council johnson yeah, I just wanted a clarifying point. I had I had somebody contact me that was interested to be on the charter uh, review committee, uh, but his hot issue was to restructure the form of government to a selectman manager. My response to that was I thought that would have to be commission and not a committee, and I just want to make sure I didn't misspeak. So I'd, I'd like to kind of weigh in on that, if you don't mind, um, Chairman Johnson, uh, because we had quite a bit of discussion about that in committee. Um, if that person has an interest on being on the review, they should uh, do that. Um, Councilor Colucci can weigh in here too. We will have an attorney involved in this process. And um, the, you know, if, if a change is suggested that is not appropriate for the committee and would require a charter um, commission, and it sounds like I don't know what selectman manager is, but if they just wanted to go to a selectman form of government without the town manager, um, that's one form of government. That would be considered probably a major change according to our attorney, but it's not cut and dry in law. But if they want to be a part of the charter committee, they should apply. And then um, that's a kind of judgment that can be made during that process. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to just add to what Betsy said, it, it would start with the committee. So if, if you know if that's something that they feel is a, an important change for the town, you go through the committee process. If the committee recommends it, the council can consider it, and we'd probably consult with attorneys about whether, if we wanted to do something like that, we need to form a commission. Is the way I'm interpreting. It. Yeah, that was, that was kind of the way that my, I, I shortcut my response. But thinking anything could come in front of the committee and they could go from there. But, uh, I was just wondering from a, from a uh, distinct decision whether a, a, a committee could actually change the structure of the government. So I think I'm good. Thank you. Any others? Tom? Councilor Colucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson. Yes. Thank you. Order number 20091 is an act on the request to approve the settlement agreement with Maine Life Care Retirement Community, otherwise known as Piper Shores. Tom? Yes. Uh, the settlement agreement is uh, has been made available as part of the, the public packet. Uh, just in some quick summation, 
uh, this will uh, attend to um, three years of, uh, I'll say, existing um, contested value and, and therefore issuing abatements. It also pertains to three years looking forward. And uh, this matter was taken up by the uh, town council in executive session, discussed at some length. Uh, I do recommend strongly that we do uh, approve this uh, and move forward. Thank you. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Discussion? Tom? Councilor Clucci. Yes. Councilor Hayes. Yes. Councilor Gleistein. Yes. Councilor Katarina. Yes. Councilor Johnson. Yes. Councilor Hamill. Yes. Chairman Johnson. Yes. Thank you. Item on number eight is non-action items. There are none. Item number nine is standing and special committee reports. If you would like to give a standing or special committee report, could you raise your hand, please? Councilor Johnson. Yeah, this quick. Did Jay leave us? Yeah, he's, yeah, I think he's all done. <laughs> no, just that uh, I was I was involved in the workshop with the uh, planning board on trying to streamline some of the processes for the innovation district. And uh, I, I do believe, I don't want to speak for him, but I, but I do believe Jay consolidated the feedback. Uh, and I, I was just actually, actually was going to ask him when that was going to come forward to the council. Do you know, Tom? I don't, but I'll follow up. Uh, I am aware that he he was tasked with consolidating it. So right. uh, as soon as that's done, I'll make certain that it comes forward. So I'm, I'm going to actually defer to Jay's report. I won't comment. It, it was an interesting conversation. And we'll wait for Jay's report. Thank you. Councilor Hayes, please. Yeah, just, yep. just a very quick update. Um, Tom did share with me that geez, after the first three months, we were really concerned about our revenues. But after the first three months, our revenues are actually tracking a little bit ahead. We would expect to be about 25% collected. We're actually excised close to 30%. Um, state revenue sharing, we're 32%. Educational subsidy, 25%. You know, electrical permits, 26%. So the good news is we're concerned about revenues, but at least through the first quarter, we're tracking right on schedule. So that's just what I'd share that with everybody. That's good news. Thank you. Any others? Okay. Uh, Councilor comments. If you would like Councilor comment, raise your hand, please. Okay. I'm going to do one quick one. Tom Souza's and community service, you guys deserve a huge kudos for what you guys have done for that, uh, the child care. If you guys haven't walked through that, you got to walk through it. It's amazing. I think it will blow you away as far as what they actually managed to do. When you heard House of Lights building, it was very hard to visualize how they were going to pull it off. And um, in some weird twist of fate, that space is perfect for what they're trying to do. I don't know how or why, but it's, it's really impressive. So I encourage everybody to go check it out. It's pretty cool. Thank you. Uh, okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second, Tom? <laughs> Please. Councilor Clucci? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Councilor Johnson? <laughs> yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. <laughs> Good night. Thank Good you night. Guys. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>